Chris Falzette from FMP Realty LLC and Paul Falzette from FMP Realty LLC. And they're here to discuss the, um, the donation of a, a parcel of property to the city of Scranton. So if you could please begin, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, City Council, for um, inviting us here this evening. Um, OECD is going to be the key lead on giving City Council and the public a presentation on this project. And hopefully after you hear the presentation, you will have um, a lot of your questions and answers and concerns uh, answered for you. Tom Preambo of my staff is going to give the presentation. Tom? Thank you, Glenda. Good evening, Council. We appreciate the, uh, your interest and your willingness to hear our story tonight about this project. Um, tonight, I'd like to give you just a quick overview of how we're going to conduct this presentation for you. Um, I'm going to give you the scope of the project. Along with that, Chris Felzetz, who are the is a developer, and his dad, Paul Fel Felzett, they are going to get, Chris will give you a brief description of his vision and his business opportunities for this corner that we're looking at on the corner of Kapaus and Marion. Okay. With that, they, we are going to ask their architect that will give you a brief overview of this beautiful building that they will erect from the old a and building. The architect, Jean Ogazala, will give you a brief description on that. Also, in your interest, is the parking lot across the street, which is the parking lot that they wish to gift to the city of Scranton. All right, Jean will give you his architectural vision of what the parking lot will look like once it is built. After Gene, we will have Sam Steiner, who is an associate from McLean Associates. McLean Associates has been hired by the Felzettes to develop and also implement, along with OECD, the landscaping and the stormwater drainage problems. And we're going to get into that. So we have some ideas there. And then I will give you um, a quick overview of what the city's goals and what the city's intentions are with our involvement. So with that, may I approach? I have some handouts for you. Thank you. And I'm sorry I didn't announce you prior to the caucus. Thank you. Okay. At this time, I'm going to ask Christopher Felzett to come up and give his statement on the development of oh, yeah. Sorry. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you folks tonight and taking the time to hear us out. My name is Chris Felzett and I am a partner in FMP Realty LLC, which is a Scranton-based real estate holding company. My business partner and myself are the investors behind the redevelopment of 1438, 1440 Kapaus Avenue, the former a and Auto Parts. The property was purchased a couple years ago with the intention of converting it into a storage facility for a local business. That said, when it came time to pursue the warehouse option, we could not pull the trigger. The reason for this was because we felt it our duty to join the small merchant environment of the area. We wanted to help continue the good work of St. Paul's Church, Nieras Pizza, Zumo's Cafe, Panel Supply Store, etc., rather than continue to burden those merchants and neighbors with the eyesore that has been there for decades. Our building project, along with the proposed conversion of the existing lot by OECD, will help ensure that the district continues to see the growth and investment it desires. The goal is very simple. Bring the feel that Mr. Paul Monsoor brought to the Hill section to that area. This will not be possible without your help and the help of OECD. A little background on myself. I'm a 33-year-old lifelong Scranton resident who started at Robert Morris School, headed over to St. Paul's, went down the street to Scranton Prep, and finished the job at the University of Scranton. Once I graduated from college, I opened my own business downtown, which I sold. I now work locally for my family's 55-year-old Scranton-based business, along with real estate development. I invested to Scranton and only want to see it advance. <clears throat> FMP Realty and its partners own seven properties in Scranton. 
Our tax burden to the city of Scranton is over $50,000 per year. The lot in question represents $794.01 of the above mentioned annual taxes paid by FMP and its partners. In addition, FMP has a proven track record of altering neighborhoods with its vision. In 1993, FMP pur purchased a vacant building in the city's south side. The former YWCA building, with a large investment from our company, led the way in making that a premier business district. In the beginning, it was just our building, the PA American Water Company, and the post office. Now it is the above mentioned, along with the Sardoni Business Park, Telespont Senior Services, Mountain View Care Center, MRI, and the MRI Center, to name a few. We are all in this together and want to make Scranton a better place. Please don't let this opportunity to help bring this neighborhood to the next level slip away. I'm confident if we all work together, we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I can ask Gene Ogazala to give his architectural description of the building. Uh, I'm Gene Ogazalek. I'm an architect. I lived on this block for 34 years. This is, this is the 1400 block of Capaus at Marion, and I live on the 1500 contiguous with the parking lot. Uh, real briefly on the building itself, it's a 6,000 square foot former a and Auto Store. I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Uh, very uh, industrial warehouse building plopped right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And I'm delighted that the Fallsettes asked me to participate because I'm very concerned about what this thing is going to look like. And I can assure you that it is going to be a wonderful building. Uh, the elevation is broken up to look like individual units rather than one large 87 foot long warehouse structure. Uh, so we're changing the roof line. Everything in here, by the way, is, is new with the exception of the shell of the structure. It's new roof, new outsides. In a couple of days, you're going to see some major demolition go on the outside of the building. It's really going to open it up. And uh, we're cutting the corner out so that you can walk through the building at the corner. And the first tenant is the Nada dress shop, and Nada is here. Uh, she is taking 3,000 square feet in the structure and there's room for two additional tenants, each tenant being about 1,500 square feet. Uh, we do keep parking on that side of the street. We're, we're not disturbing that at all. But the lot on the other side of the street has been vacant for 25 years, whatever it is. And that is part of this property. And I suggested that why don't we put angle parking on that lot. Now, I am the architect who designed all of the angle parking on Penn Avenue. I literally put those stripes down with my son, uh, whatever it was, eight, nine years ago, and the city came up and painted right behind us, and that was November, right before Christmas. So the, the geometry of the angle parking and so on, we, we know it works. Uh, we're getting seven spaces. We had eight, but we made room for uh, handicap accessibility space, OECD brought that to our attention. We thought we can have a handicap spot on the other side of the street, but they said, let's put one here. We did that. All new curbing, new landscaping, three new historic lights to match the city's spec. Uh, the budget on the parking lot is $59,000, of which about 9000 is landscaping. Uh, we have a 15-foot green space between the parking and the curb and the adjacent fence. And it is, uh, it is going to make this corner uh, a very pleasant place to walk through, as opposed to one that's been strewn with weeds and, and broken glass for a long, long time. Uh, what, I, what I really am very positive about is somebody is making an investment in my neighborhood, 500,000 at a minimum. Uh, to, to resurrect a building that really nobody wanted. And also, one of the big pluses, and I'm almost done, Chris, one of the big pluses on the block is that we have Zumo's. Zumo's is the cafe, and it's just a fantastic place. Uh, lots of great people from Scranton, from the university, frequent that on a daily basis. 
Uh, they're in the middle of the block. This is going to be on the end of the block. Nearest is across the street. Uh, we have the, uh, the uniform shop, which did a nice job in front on Kapaus Avenue and fixing that up. So I think it's going to resurrect the corner. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity. And I just want to thank, you know, the Fallsettes for asking me to, to participate in the project. And uh, delighted to be here. Any questions? Thank you, Gene. At this time, I'm going to ask Sam Steiner from McLean Associates to come up and give him, give us his presentation of the modern day technology that's available for addressing the stormwater runoff. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm Sam Steiner from McLean Associates. I did the landscape plan for the vacant lot. Um, <clears throat> the only zoning requirements are a buffer yard, and like Gene mentioned, they have a, they have a buffer yard in there about uh, 15 uh, feet there. Uh, then there is a 90% evergreen hedge uh, that's supposed to uh, run alongside a residential property, minimum four feet in height. And we have proposed uh, 40 um, arborvitaes. Actually, they're going to be installed at six feet in height. So, and three feet on center. So you'll get that instant evergreen hedge to stop any headlights, um, any cars from parking in the stalls, headlights from shining into the residential properties there. Um, uh, one, tr one tree is supposed to be uh, planted per every 3,000 square feet of impervious surfaces laid down. We're actually only installing about uh, 1,600 square feet of impervious surfaces, but we do have three trees in the plan, just, just to add to the looks of the parcel. Um, if you see in the back of your packet there, um, I wrote a letter um, just kind of explaining how uh, the Scranton Sewer Authority is looking to get involved in this project. Um, I don't want to read the letter verbatim, but the, uh, the sewer authority <clears throat> sees this project as an opportunity to advance the implementation of their long-term control plan. And I don't want to get into specifics of their long-term control plan, but they have to, uh, <clears throat> they're basically required to, uh, to take a certain amount of volume of water out of their conveyance system. Um, and we plan, uh, in their long-term control plan, and they have several approaches to how to do this. And the long-term control plan does suggest to use green infrastructure approaches um, as a way uh, to not only beautify the city, but as alternatives to the gray infrastructure approaches that often take a, a quite a bit of maintenance and, and have a great deal of overhead. Um, and uh, the authority, the Scranton author Sewer Authority, is also looking at this project as kind of like a demonstration project to other architects and engineers in the area of how green infrastructure could be implemented throughout the city. Um, so like I said, they're willing to partner with the OECD to supply some funds to uh, implement the green infrastructure strategies on this project. Is, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Okay, we've heard what our partnership looks like for the city of Scranton OECD, all right, to benefit the local community at the intersection of Kapalas Avenue and Marion, okay. It is the sole intent of the city of Scranton to provide that economic development in an area that has great potential. Our mission and our vision always is and always will be, wherever possible, to participate and become a partner with any economic development initiative. We do not want to miss an opportunity to become a partner with a private entity. It is our wish to become that partner and deliver a project with long-term stability for the community. For your information, I would just like to do a quick overview of the project assets. What are we delivering that doesn't really cost hardly anything to the city of Scranton? The developer, FMP Realty, Chris and his dad, are providing all of the technical assistance in the creation of the project plans for construction. That is almost unheard of today. In addition, the consultants 
the team that we have assembled, will be providing OECD with all of the technical support needed to deliver the project whole. In other words, if OECD has a question when we hire a contractor, these professionals are there to support that need at no cost to the city of Scranton. I want to be sure I stress that, at no cost to the city of Scranton. In addition, another asset that we have as a partner is the Scranton Sewer Authority. They may be providing assistance up to $15,000 for the development of this lot that Sam just delineated, the concepts, the modern technologies that are available to control the stormwater runoff. When the project is completed, the site will provide a small area of green space and trees that will be pleasant to the community that Sam had also talked about and it also supportive of the ecosystem. In addition, the project, it will provide a parking lot for end off street lighting with handicap accessibility. Very, very important today. To my knowledge, we have no zoning issues because the city will be the sole owner and it will be used for public use only. Now, you'll ask, how do I know that? Well, I've reached out to our zoning officer, I've reached out to our planning, um, city planner, I'm sorry. In your packet, there's an email that I have stating such. Okay. All of the environmental reviews have been completed and submitted to OECD so that we can have a proper eligible project. This project is eligible under CDBG funding through the Lomod area, therefore meeting all the national objectives required by HUD. This project has been given community support. The neighbors are looking for something positive to happen in this area. It's very evident. Jean spoke of that from the heart. OECD is planning on submitting a CDBG application for the funding round of 2014's action plan to support the project. The project budget has been attached to your packet. Okay. In closing, if you want to ask some questions now, that's fine. If you want to wait until I get done, that's fine too. But in closing, what we want to see is a project in this area as an opportunity for success. It requires a minimum amount of risk because of the partnership that has been created with the city and the partnership beyond with the developer. A minimum amount of risk with a huge potential for a return on our investment. The Felzets is investing in their infrastructure, in their building. They have a lot of skin in this game, all right? We would have a very, very small amount. So the risk factor has been diluted by the partnership, which will provide a, ga a, a greater gain on our return for investment. We remain hopeful that following our presentation tonight, that you all collectively, as a city council, will be willing to place your trust in this project and vote in favor to provide a positive impact for the needs of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, uh, since the presentation is concluded, we'll start with questions by council members. Uh, Mr. McGough, do you have any questions for uh, our guests? Yes, please. Uh, I think our primary concern had to do with the parking lot that was going to be across the street from the development. Um, and I just want to maybe reiterate a couple of things. First, the cost of redeveloping or redoing that parking lot would be entirely upon the developers and not the city. It is our vision that once the project is gifted over to the city of Scranton, OECD will submit an application for a 2014's action plan for CBG funding. Okay, it's an eligible project for Lomod in Lomod area, meeting the national objective. That's the direction that we're going for funding. With that, 
as I have outlined, I believe the second to the last page, or the last page, the additional costs, the anticipated cost, will be reduced by the infusion of funds from the Scranton Sewer Authority. The, the work on that would be part of the overall project or would it then be a separate, a separate bid or a separate uh, um, project through OECD? That is correct. It will be a separate project funded through CWG funding and administered through the procurement process through OECD. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGough. Mr. Rogan, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you, and thank you all for coming in. Um, I certainly have a lot more information about this project than when I think all of us initially received legislation to accept a parking lot for the city with no rhyme or reason. Um, it certainly threw up some red flags, and um, one of the issues I had, and th this might be for Mr. Penetar, um, in the past, I know there was an issue with the parking lot in question. Was that mostly related to the auto store and residents? Stay right. Oh, you could stay there. Can I, no, no, you could stay. Microphone. <laughs> okay. Um, let, let me start by first saying. Uh, I think this is a great project that's helpful to the city. Uh, I'm very, I know the Falls Zets, I have great confidence in them, and I know the Mr. Ogazana, and uh, great confidence in him. Um, and, and the lot presently is an eyesore. If you drive by it, it, it's an eyesore. And I think we should do everything possible to make this work. Um, but I hate to be the black cloud here. Um, my worry is this. Uh, that lot was the subject of a zoning case um, probably in excess of 15 years ago where the uh, neighbors vehemently objected to that property being used as a, as a parking lot. And the case went all the way up to the, I believe the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania and, and the neighbors ended up winning. Um, the approximately a year or two ago uh, there was a case before our zoning board now where somebody wanted to open up a restaurant and, and I think Gene was even at the hearing um, and uh, people from the neighborhood came in and their statements were uh, we don't want that used as a parking lot we've spent half our life fighting that parking lot um, so I, I'm just a little worried about what the neighbors are going to think. I don't know if Gene being in the neighborhood, maybe he can round them up and, and get them to uh, come on board. Uh, but I, that, that's, my, that's my worry here. I've been down there for I've been working on the project down there for countless weeks, months, almost a year now. I've pretty much touched base with every single neighbor and to my knowledge having spoke to 15 to 20 of them everybody's behind this the issues that go back to a and a had to do with the major concern being that folks were going to buy something in the auto parts store okay and then work on their car across the street not to mention when they bought it the parking lot they just ripped down a house and decided it was a parking lot there was no presentation to zoning I believe at that time they just did what they wanted now as far as the restaurant goes it was my understanding that uh, possible implications with a liquor license potentially going down there exhaust fans, exhaust fans was an issue, issue. Uh, they wanted to put a dumpster across the street to support the restaurant so <laughs> I that's my understanding on why that got shot down but as of today, with the proposed retail spaces, the green space, uh, and the parking for public use, 
everybody's been in support of it that I've spoken to. And I, I took a trip down um, last week to take a look at the area myself, and I, I spoke to a few neighbors when I was down there as well, and they pretty much said the same thing that you did, um, that they basically didn't want people changing their oil in a parking lot in front of their house. Um, that was the gist I got from the, the couple neighbors that I talked to, and that was one of the concerns that I had previous to, to your presentation. Um, just looking through at the project, it does, it does look like it'll be a complete turnaround for that area. Um, could you talk a little more, now we've talked about the, the, um, the funding for the parking lot project, but the building that you're doing, that, that's private funding, the, correct? Correct. And to go back over the parking lot, up to date, we have thousands of dollars invested into the engineering of the parking lot that we would like to turn over to the city for the projects that OECD and the sewer authority will do. Across the street, which is a separate entity, so to say, on the tax logs, is a privately funded project that we're doing and we're converting it into three retail spaces. And every day, the budget seems to get a little higher and higher. So we, when Mr. Preambo made the comment that we have skin in the game, we, we absolutely do. And, and that was my, one of the concerns I had. I'm glad that you addressed it because if both sides of this were government funded, I know I would be hesitant to support it, but with seems the major development is being funded by by your company um, this is just a little side bonus I guess um, to try to get it going and provide some parking um, I did have concerns as well um, with the taxes and I know that was included in here as well I believe you pay around fifty thousand dollars in taxes yeah. a year and F this is six hundred correct this is seven hundred and ninety four dollars and one cent FMP Realty and its partners uh, on our residents and commercial properties, which the partners are me and my father, have a tax burden of over $50,000 a year to the city of Scranton. I'm closing on a new house tomorrow in the city of Scranton, and I looked at the lovely transfer tax. So uh, we, we are taxpayers in the city of Scranton, that's for sure. Yeah, and the, the transfer tax is definitely something I would hope to tackle in, uh, yeah, that, in the next few that, years. I, Being somebody who bought a house within the last few months myself, I, I know I, it's I would uh, like to see you tackle that, <laughs> trust me. But thank you um, for, for all this information. I, I know I have a, a much better um, idea of how I'm going to go on this now than I did when, just, when the, just the black and white legislation was in front of us. Um, going out to the site and visiting it on my own and, and the sketches and, and this presentation really um, really helped me make my decision. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Councilman Loscombe, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you. I appreciate you all coming here tonight. And again, as Mr. Rogan stated, uh, thank you for the packet of information. I do have some questions. Um, some of them have been asked and, and possibly answered. Um, this area is a low to mod income area that qualifies for this project, correct? That is correct, Councilman. Okay. And Mr. Rogan asked if, if the building itself was going to involve any uh, city funding or OECD funding or anything. It's totally private funded. 100%. Okay. Um, does this, this I guess is for attorney uh, Pinatar. Does this building itself require off street parking or parking facilities for it, for the building itself? We have approximately 6,000 square feet of what potentially could be retail space, is what it sounds like. Uh, so there would be parking requirements uh, for off-street parking. Um, my, my, my comment would be this. Uh, if the parking lot were to be made, maintained privately owned, then you'd need zoning approval for sure. With it being publicly owned and it becomes a public use of a city owned property, Mr. Wallace gave an opinion that it would not need uh, zoning approval. I, I haven't researched that, but I, I'm going to tend to say yes, that's probably right. Um, I, again, I'm just worried about the neighbors filing an appeal for Mr. Wallace's opinion, uh, saying that maybe they do need zoning approval 
Uh, I'm just throwing the, that out. I, I, I'm going to tend to side with Mr. Wallace that I don't think they do need zoning approval if it's publicly owned and used for public purposes. Um, you and the public that, purpose would oh, be it, it'd have to be open to the public, not just the right. people uh, staying, uh, shopping at the retail spot. You had mentioned that other businesses have come before the zoning board for approval and right. they were turned down because of parking and, and certain issues or I, I'm not going to say they were the, the the restaurant was turned down now there were a number of issues some of which uh, Chris uh, touched on you know the uh, ventilation exhaust liquor license things like that but the parking did come up as an issue and neighbors did come up and testify saying that they've spent too much of their life fighting the parking lot to let See, it be a parking I'm lot. I'm a lot That's older than Mr. Rogan, and I think this and, issue and started before he was even born. <laughs> it probably <laughs> was. <laughs> with AMA. So, I, you know, I have a little familiarity with the history of the parking issues there, mm -hmm. and I would just, you know, that, that's my biggest concern also. Exactly. Yeah, and the dumpster, they were, yeah. They didn't, they had, that's right, they had no place to keep the dumpster. They they were they had a uh, an agreement to use St. Paul's yeah, Church, but they yeah. Okay, I think first of all, I think it's a great project. I mean, it's come a long way since Gus's brew house was on the corner there. So anybody is familiar with that? That and, and it's got a, it's got a long way to come. Um, any improvement is great in this area. Again, my biggest concern is with the parking, with the history. Uh, you know, the neighbors, uh, Mr. Ogozalek, Ogozalek. Uh, I'm sorry. Were you uh, were you one of the people that fought against that parking lot when it was A and A? Uh, I and Mr. Catone led the charge in stopping A and A uh, from warehousing in the house. And then A and A illegally subdivided the lot, sold the house because they couldn't use it, and then park uh, paved the lot uh, illegally. And then we stopped that, and that subsequently went to the state supreme court, and we were upheld. So when that pavement went down, and they took the trees out and the grass out and everything, and they paved from the curb to the fence the entire thing. Uh, that's what we've looked at for over 15 or 20 years. This is quite a long time. It's like 1985. Long time. And I live on the block and walk around the corner, and my kids grew up on the block, and uh, it's, it's full of weeds. Uh, as a resident of the block, I, I can tell you, uh, I do not know of anybody on our block who's against this project uh, in, for parking or otherwise. I think if you go into the fine communities like uh, Charleston and Savannah and so on, you'll see shops in the middle of residential areas that survive. They, they, they find a way to park and they do it. I, I don't think there's a great demand of parking for this retail. I don't think it's going to clog the streets. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the parking we have across the street and angle parking it will work. Uh, I am the architect of the mall for Mr. Boscoff. Uh, so I designed those 2,000 spaces over there. Uh, I think it's going to work. I don't think it's going to be a, a detrimental to the neighbors uh, for parking uh, at all whatsoever. And by the way, this little lot that was left over is it's too small to park inside it and you can't park it from a zoning point of view we're 1a across the street this this building is 1b so there's a whole plethora of really bad things happening with restaurants and everything else this is a very quiet thing uh, Zumo's on the block has no parking it works people park in St. Paul's or park on the street and it's nice to see that activity, it really is. So I, th I think that synergy with, Zuma, with Zumo's and Nero's across the street and then this fine retail shop with Nada is, uh, is really terrific. And it appears from the plan, what is it, six parking spots plus a handicap? Is that yes, what it is? that's correct. Okay. And it's accessed right from the street, from Marion right. at Marion. That's street. correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Again, I think it's a great project and everything. My biggest fear is the parking lot, the history of the parking lot. Uh, can, can someone come back at us now and say, listen, it was approved, and we fought for it, and, and we didn't get approval before, and now it's a parking lot? 
Does it, does it pass the smell test? In other words, the city is taking over so they can do anything with it. You know, I, I mean, that's my take on it. I don't want to run into another certificate of nonconformance issue like the zoning board has just run into. That's my concern. You know, and, and, and in all honesty, I, I love this project. I want to see it fly. But there's a history there, and I don't want to see the history come back and bite us on the butt. That's my only worry. Can I add something? Sure. Um, when, as soon as we submit our 2014 action plan, that will include the application for this property. It will be, have to be publicly advertised, and we are required by law to list every activity that we, re, we are going to fund in the Scranton Times. It will be, and then uh, Scranton City Council has their public hearing. And if there is any objections to this parking lot, the public, they do have the opportunity to come before City Council or write to OECD and object funding this project that you will be aware of. Sure. So and I'm again, not I sure mean, if this. This project's great. It has my blessing as long as we don't have to face those issues. If the public is against it or we're in, in, in danger of any kind of lawsuit over this, you know, then I will be against it. Because it just, uh, you know, it's just one thing after another, and, and I don't want to see this, this happening. And I, that's my opinion. And let's see here. And I guess that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lascom. Uh, I personally have all my questions answered. All my questions were answered during the presentation, and I would just like to thank Mr. Preambo, uh, Mr. Paul Falzett, Mr. Chris Falzett, uh, Ms. Linda Abley, and Attorney Daniel Penetar for coming in tonight and uh, delivering uh, a, a very effective presentation that gave us all a better idea of the uh, project that um, is hopefully going to take place. Uh, I'm in support of this project, and I wish you much success if it's, or I, I wish that everything goes out well if um, it is approved tonight. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, call this caucus Thank to close. You. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silent reflection or prayer as we remember all of those who passed in our community over the past week. And also as re we remember the servicemen and women stationed around the globe who continue to fight for our freedom and our way of life and also all of the veterans. Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscom? Here. Mr. Joyce? Here. Mrs. Evans? <clears throat> Dispense with the reading of the minutes. Third order, 3A. rendered by the Zoning Hearing Board meeting held June 12, 2013. Are there any comments? If not received and filed. 3B tax assessor's report received June 13, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C single tax office city funds distributed comparison for 
2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3D, agenda for the City Planning Commission meeting held June 26, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3E, minutes of the Composite Pension Board meeting held May 22, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3F, controller's report for the month ending May 31, 2013. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. <laughs> Are there any clerk's notes? No, Mr. Joyce. Do any council members have announcements at this time? Uh, just one. Uh, this Saturday, uh, there will be a performance at Nayog Park by Jimmy Stir, starting at 7.30, followed by a firework, the city fireworks, uh, 4th of July fireworks uh, presentation or celebration. Um, that's this Saturday at 7.30 at Nayog Park, and it's the, up near the gazebo near the pool, past the pool. And that was all. Thank you, Mr. McGough. Do any other council members have announcements? <clears throat> I just have one. Uh, Councilwoman Evans will be attending tonight's meeting. She is running behind. And that's all. Uh, if there is no other uh, business, we can move on to citizens' participation. And tonight, our first speaker is Les Spindler. City resident, homeowner, taxpayer. Uh, first, I have a question. That award that's due to the firefighters and police union, is that supposed to be by June 30th? Yes, that's the original date. That, does the uh, city have that money? No, the city does not have to, that money. The city is currently under uh, talks with Janie Montgomery Scott to borrow the money to pay the firefighters and police officers their supreme, the Supreme Court award. Yeah, that's been going on for quite a while, hasn't it? It has been going on so for a while. So what's going to happen if by Sunday, which is the 30th, that they don't get the money? Okay. Under uh, the current terms, uh, it, the interest will grow on that amount. Oh. I guess that'll be good for the firefighters and police. I don't know if it'll be bad for anybody else. <laughs> all right, that's all I have to say on that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the meeting. They were talking about that, that zoning board issue. And I agree with what Mrs. Chilipko said. I think Kara Seitzinger or Paul Kelly should resign. They had no, uh, no right getting involved in that even. The law department had no, no right doing that. And uh, that's what's been wrong with this administration for 12 years now. Uh, another thing. Uh, Mr. Laska made a comment that he wasn't with the CLIC a few weeks ago. And, well, I'm with you, Mr. Laska. I'm not with the CLIC either. I've been trying to get the corner of my property fixed for 10 years now. It was fixed once two years ago, I think, but it just came apart again. And uh, if you're part of the clique, I guess you get things taken care of right away. As uh, Councilman Rogan can attest, I've been coming here for years and years asking about that. But nothing happens to me. And, and Council has sent, I would say, probably a dozen requests um, to, to the DPW, and unfortunately it hasn't happened yet. Uh, Hopefully with the new administration next year, more things will get done. Maybe we'll have to wait till Mayor Courtright takes over because I think that's going to happen. Uh, moving on. Recently, after the election, a few speakers have been coming here to criticize the incoming council. How anybody can criticize somebody that's not even seated up there yet, I have no idea. <laughs> a speaker came here two weeks ago and said they made empty promises. So, well, if they're not seated up there, how could you call them empty promises? They haven't even had a chance to do anything yet. And as Councilman Rogan has proven, I think he's done his best to fight for the taxpayers of his city. So if he was included in making those empty promises, I think these speakers are wrong. And uh, 
I, that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker tonight is Ron Elman. Yes, hello, Council. I take great exception to Representative Haggerty's letter in today's Times expressing his overwhelming exuberance of having the university within our city limits. You know that he, he I don't know how, how many of you read his letter today, but it, it's nothing but praise for an entity that brags about taking, taking in $400 million and not giving nothing to the city. They sponge off the taxpayers a, 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 a terrible burden that they've put on us. And if you read the paper the 50 and 25 years ago, you see this has been going on 50 years ago. They, they were the same thing we have now, growing like a big octopus in the middle of the city. It, it, it just, it's just got to be stopped, and every time they're confronted, they're just like a big bully, and, and nobody's supposed to go against them. I was, I was told by an attorney that the owner of a property can't designate or de-designate the, the, uh, historical value that w when they ask for it, that it has to go through a legal process. A and here they are. When you people support the legal process, the university has a fit that they weren't given into like, like you always do. To me, if it doesn't produce any tax money, we don't need it. And that's how I feel about them. It's, it's too bad that this university isn't in Mr. Blake's backyard. Maybe uh, if he had the tax burden we do, he might feel a little different about it. Every, every, every time I go someplace in the city, it's just, it's, it's, it's just deteriorating. I got about 15 feet of sidewalk on the 2500 block North Main that was tore up by the people that demolished uh, the property there. They fixed the street when they tore it up, but they won't fix the sidewalk. You know, th this makes the whole neighborhood look bad. I got nothing around me but empty houses that the grass isn't cut. I saw Jack Liptide today after some some property but that doesn't help that doesn't help me any with my, my my taxes and my i'm not getting nothing for my tax dollar like i stand here every week and say it i got i got cars on the sidewalk with all four wheels you can't use it i got these quads running around one two three o'clock in the morning the boys, they don't have mufflers on half of them. I know they don't go home that way. I got cars going by the house with the radio so loud you could hear them in Harrisburg. You know, my, my neighborhood, the last couple of years, it's just terrible. I'm very fortunate that the two people on each side of me take such good care of their homes. I don't know what I'd do. I'm probably the worst looking house of the three. But I try, I get my grass cut. But I look across the street, I got some kind of business over there with a bunch of trucks that looks like hell. It's just nasty. Next to it's a house that's empty. I look the other way, I got three or four empty houses. This, something has got to be done to help the tax base of this city, and, and, and I don't know what it is, but it's some kind of enforcement we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. 
Our next speaker is Doug Miller. Good evening, Council. Doug Miller, Scranton. Uh, going to uh, spend uh, my time tonight addressing uh, the University of Scranton project. I know uh, we've had an awful lot of discussion on that in recent weeks, and uh, I thought we put it to sleep uh, two weeks ago, but it seems uh, as if uh, it keeps uh, reappearing again. Uh, so I figured it was important for me to address this issue tonight and, and basically uh, summarize my, uh, my opinion on this once and for all and put it to bed. Uh, obviously, we didn't have a meeting last week, so I didn't get a chance to respond to the Scranton Times editorial uh, in June 16th edition. Uh, the editorial board went on to, uh, and I'm going to cite some of the paragraphs, the beginning of the editorial, which stated, under direction of uh, Council President Janet Evans, Council Chambers long has been a dark place where progress has been thwarted by narrow vision and mere vindic and vindictiveness has masqueraded as political dissent. One of the worst examples occurred last week when Mrs. Evans and her sidekick, Jack Loscombe, offered circular logic as a substitute for leadership in the city's best interest. This is, was, was in regards to the University of Scranton's $47.5 million building to replace the former YWCA building. Again, that's a $47.5 million building. It's about half, almost half of the city's operating budget for the year 2013. Let's keep that in mind. Indeed, the building is old, but doesn't share history like the Cultural Center, the Albright Library, or the Radisson. And they go on and on, and they conclude the editorial by saying, the time says, call for a new vote. Council must take action once again. Well, you're right, indeed, the building is old, and they go on to compare it to the Cultural Center and the Albright Library and the Radisson. But the fact of the matter is, history still remains there, whether you want to compare it to the Radisson or the Masonic Temple or any other historical structure in the city. The bottom line is it's a historical structure and it should not be torn down. I strongly encourage council to stay the course. There's no reason to go back to another vote. What you simply did was you looked out for the little guy, as you've done, the three of you, Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. Loscombe, have done for three and a half years. You weren't going to be bullied. You showed leadership and you showed courage and you stood up to the bully. You know, last week, uh, I was very troubled by this article right here, Rogan Backs University of Scranton Plan. You know, and it took me back to last summer, and I think we all know what took place last summer. The city was on the verge of bankruptcy. We were ready to throw in the towel. Uh, we faced payless paydays. We had city employees making seven twenty-five an hour. Uh, we faced serious financial challenges. We could all remember. We, we were embarrassed uh, all over the country. And this council faced many op obstacles. You had many tough decisions to make. And there were three people who I remember worked tirelessly on this council on behalf of the residents of the city to craft that recovery plan. It was Mrs. Evans, it was Mr. Joyce, and it was Mr. Loscombe. And this took me back to, yet again, more grandstanding and theatrics to the TV camera by Mr. Rogan. Now we want to be a lapdog for the University of Scranton. You know, Mr. McGough, I could expect it from. He's, it's been no, no secret. He's been a cheerleader for the university since he's been on council. So I wasn't surprised by that. But it really infuriates me as a resident of this city to see this here. This isn't leadership. This is giving in to a bully. This is showing a lack of leadership and a lack of courage. There's no explanation for it. Yeah, it's nice to talk about permits and fees. It's nice to talk about jobs. They're all one-time sources. You know, we hear a lot about numbers, and I was mocked for calling it a joke a few weeks ago. But we hear an awful lot about all these big numbers, these astronomical amount of numbers, millions of dollars in permits and fees. Well, today I filed a right to know request, and I'm going to get the truth. I'm going to get an answer in black and white. We're going to talk fact. We're not going to talk hypotheticals. We're going to get real numbers. I requested a list of all the permits and licenses that the university has taken out in the last 12 years, covering the whole entire Doherty administration. And let's see where it really is. Mr. McGough likes to cite 5 million, 10 million. I don't know where he gets his numbers from. But perhaps tonight he can, add, he can tell me what uh, the university plans to take out for this particular project. I mean, you seem to be very good with numbers. I mean, I would, I would think uh, as an educational uh, institution, they should be able to supply these numbers. Uh, you it, know, it's it's 445,000. OK. Uh, economic impact of close to a million dollars. And where, where did you get that? Is that in writing? Is that factual information? It's as factual as uh, you're going to find, yes. Do you have that in writing? Is it in black and white, or is that just hypothetical? Mr. Miller, 
I gave you. Is it hypothetical, though? Do you have that in black and white? Is what I'm asking. You know, we it's it's easy to sit behind the podium and and discuss numbers and and, and pull numbers out of the sky. I'm asking for factual information. We've talked an awful lot about pie in the sky figures. I'm looking for black and white on paper. I'm not interested in what we what we think or what we suppose one million dollars in economic uh, development. I want fact. Uh, and perhaps Mr. Rogan and Mr. McGough can go knock on the university's door and maybe get that information since uh, you seem to be in bed with them right now. Uh, you know, I just think it's a real troubling thing. It goes yet again back to the grandstanding and playing to the camera. And perhaps some of us have missed our true calling. Maybe it isn't city government. Maybe our true calling is out in New York City at Broadway because we do a sure heck of a good job playing to that TV camera every week. But this city needs leadership. We've seen what actors and theatrics have done for this city. That's why we're in the situation we're in today. And a comment was made earlier tonight about the future of the council. The future of the council is very bleak, believe it or not. We need leadership in this city. And I, th I commend you three, Mrs. Evans, Mr. Joyce, and Mr. Laskin, for standing up to the bullies. I wish we could say the same for Mr. McGough and Mr. Ogan, but they choose to be university lapdogs, and it's an unfortunate thing. Thank you, Mr. Thank Miller. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bob Bolas. Evening, Council. Bob Bolas, Scranton. Good evening. Good evening. When Good do evening. they plan on opening the polls? Is there a date or a time frame when they, uh, it's on the agenda here when uh, they intend to open the polls? Uh, I believe I announced at the last council meeting that NAOG's pools were opening that weekend, and I believe they did, and that two additional neighborhood pools were scheduled for opening on June 29th, followed by uh, the remaining two pools as soon as possible thereafter, and that is uh, being held up by um, the ability to secure lifeguards. Okay. It was just a curiosity question. You know, I've been away from here for a while, and uh, been following what's been going on. And one of the things that I find very, very upsetting, I've been coming here 12, 14 years, whatever, and numerous other people have come here, yet I haven't seen one idea that's ever been approached from this podium to the past councils and all that's ever been uh, taken serious. And uh, one of them is, and I found it really amusing, I was reading the paper last week and saw about the university. Well, the university is going to spend so many million to tear a building down, put up a new building. We saw the uh, medical college get a donated church from the Naples over by Cooper's there. A great part of the history of the city is a black parking lot. Is there any history in that? Absolutely nothing. The mighty university, they made a comment. Well, if we can't do the why, we have other plans. Well, what are your other plans? Tell us about them. You're going to get a permits, as I just heard here. Uh, there's no factual amount of a million dollars, or it's 850,000 in permits. Nobody knows how much they are, because nobody knows what the heck is going on. But we're good at throwing numbers around. Let's throw numbers around. How many millions of dollars should the university have paid in the last 30 years as a nonprofit, and are sure and far from what you would call nonprofit, when you spend 40 million for this, buy lots, that uh, houses that somebody wanted a minimum amount and pay hundreds of thousands more than anybody else, build another big building that went up 70, 80 million dollars. It's a heck of a lot more than being a nonprofit. Pay huge salaries, do whatever what they want. We did Mulberry Street, drive down there. There's parking on Mulberry Street. There shouldn't be any parking on it at all. But lo and behold, the university gets parking, and you come down, kids are walking across the street. There shouldn't be any parking on Mulberry Street at all, university or not, where they park by the school. But yet they get away with it. But sit down here and let your meter run by for a couple minutes, and you got a $20, $30 ticket. But the university gets away with it. My pet peeve is the why should stay where it is. It's our history, not the university's history, it's our history. 
I don't care what councilmen here think that it should do this and do that. I'm not patronized by the university. I don't owe the university anything. They owe us. They owe every taxpayer in this city a granted more than token dollars that amount to no more than a wage for somebody. I've asked that a fee, a public service fee, be put on everybody in this city, across the board, that you would be paying 13 to 14 million, maybe even more, on their gross. No more than you would be paying on your gross wages through the single tax office. And you'll get snickers and say, oh, they shouldn't pay that. The heck they shouldn't. They're a bully with money. They've politicalized the whole area. And they've taken advantage of everybody. And council after council after council and administrative people just sat back and let it happen. You know, stop worrying about what the university is and how many jobs. They're going to build a building. After the building's done, what happens to the people that work there? There's no more jobs there. They're gone. Whether they're from this area or wherever they come from. Take the bridge. We've all listened about the nonsense on the Moosley Street Bridge that involved one of our vehicles. Well, they tore it down because the bridge was falling down. But why are they tearing all the other bridges down on Moosley Street, on the Spruce Street Complex? They're ripping them all out, too. The truck had nothing to do with them. Why? Because they were falling down. Look what happened on Harrison Avenue. Yet for seven months, vehicles went underneath that bridge, and they didn't even bother to put netting up to protect the people underneath. Who was really risking a catastrophe? Yet they want to go play games. We need to make the people in this community, the university and the rest of them, held accountable, the leachate line, the things you need to bring in, the millions of dollars that are available out there and put patronizing people to the side and the big dollar people that have bullied the city long enough with their lawsuits and their threats and haven't paid. Look at all the parking garages that the big shots have not paid a dime on. And Thank then tell you. me the university's creating a lot more for this city. Thank you, Mr. Bull. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Rick Schrader. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here before you. I'm Rick Schrader, business manager of uh, the Electricians, Local 81, and we're located at 431 Wyoming Avenue. Uh, I'm here tonight to, uh, to talk to the Council and to tell them some of my concerns that I have uh, with the University of Scranton project. Uh, I disagree with the people that spoke before me. I think that the University of Scranton is not trying to bully anyone. I think that the University of Scranton is trying to provide a quality education for the people that do go there. And I think everyone up there realizes that one out of uh, 10 people in the city of Scranton were either alumni, students, or employees of the University of Scranton. I think they contribute a lot, and I did speak about that prior times, about some of the economic impact they have in the city. I think everybody understands that. Everyone sees what happens in downtown Scranton. Lo and behold, if we didn't have the university there, I don't know what some of the uh, merchants in downtown Scranton would be. I think we'd be with a lot less people in downtown Scranton. I can tell you as a, a business manager of, uh, of a local union that I see our members also suffer. Our local union has approximately 200 members that live in the city of Scranton. They pay city taxes, they pay real estate taxes, uh, they pay the wage taxes, they pay the garbage fees, uh, definitely part of this community. They believe in this community and uh, they support it as much as they possibly can. I see also that us having one of the largest unemployment rates in the state of Pennsylvania, that there's some jobs that are sorely needed. I see every day come, people come into my office, uh, grown men come in not knowing where they're going to turn because they're losing health care for themselves, their families, their, their children. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a big burden. I know that that's their problem, but you know what? I see this as a situation that we could have a win-win. I think that, you know, people want to try to get an exact number. We never have an exact number when something's going out, but when there's a projection, I think that that's a fair projection of what will be put forward. If there's a million dollars that would come into this city of Scranton that would take that much money off of the taxpayers' backs, I think that that's a positive, a win-win. If it can create jobs, 
for the people that live within this area, within the city of Scranton, I think that that's a big positive step for us. Uh, I also think that we, we need to take a look at uh, um, the area around us and, and what does happen if we don't move forward. The uh, HARB approved the demolition of the building at Leahy Hall. And what we would ask is uh, that you would reconsider tonight uh, the prospects of taking that, the demolition down, and we know that the zoning board disapproved that. I'm sure that the university will work with what they have to do to correct that situation. Uh, I do think that it's important that you know that our, our members, uh, you know, we have an apprenticeship program that uh, you have 47 college credits towards when you, for a bachelor's degree or 30 towards an associate degree. Uh, we train all of our people. All of that is not one penny cost to the taxpayers. Uh, we believe in this city, and we certainly want to do the best that we can. We think that we can work together uh, and, and have some jobs created, get some financial help for the city of Scranton, and uh, have a project that I think would be a beautiful building that would be coming into the downtown area that would make another statement about Scranton being progressive and moving forward. So I would ask you for your reconsideration tonight, and I thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Drew Simpson. Good evening, Council. Good evening. Uh, again, my name is Drew Simpson. I represent the Carpenters Local Union 645 in Scranton. And to answer Mr. Newcomb's uh, editorial from Sunday, yes, I am a resident of the city of Scranton. I am speaking here tonight to express my members' sincere displeasure and bewilderment pertaining to the Council's actions over the past three meetings concerning the University of Scranton's rehabilitation project. The actions taken by Council have directly impacted the well-being of the members whom I represent. Members who, when working, pay to the city of Scranton in wage taxes, $2,000 a year. If you multiply that by the number of carpenters that will be required to complete this building over the next two years, you're looking at a much needed revenue for the city of Scranton that will not be paid if they are not working. The members who I represent are losing their, are losing their homes and their health insurance due to the economic downturn currently gripping the nation and the region. Our health insurance is based on hours worked and is not paid by the taxpayers' monies. So if, you, if they do not work, then they lose their health insurance. Senate Bill 1310 that was passed by the state recently makes it very difficult for members of the building trades to collect unemployment. When they are not working, and this also categorizes them in with migrant, fi migrant farm workers. This project will bring a huge relief for the members of Local 645 at a time when it is needed. I visit job sites daily and see the out-of-state license plates working on projects with no real direct benefit to the city. And here we have a project that will be directly that will directly impact the city and its residents and is sitting waiting for approval by one government entity, the city of Scranton and its elected members. I'm sorry, city council and its elected members. The United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners of America offers a four-year apprenticeship program to interested people that is free of charge to the apprentice. We take students who have graduated from the Career Technology Center or Johnson College and give them an opportunity. These apprentices work in the field while attending training one week a quarter, so they are earning a wage while being trained. Upon the completion of their four years of training, they graduate with 32 credit hours towards an associate's degree. We currently have a backlog of approved applicants that totals 36 young people looking for a future in our area where they can earn a family-sustaining wage, have health benefits, and receive a dignified retirement when they are of age. So the current actions of the City Council are not only affecting the current residents of the city, but also the future of our young people who may, not, who may have to move out of the city to find work. I strongly ask you tonight to support our members and the working families of this great city and reintroduce the recommendation of the Historical Architectural Review Board to approve the demolition of the building in question and approve the certificate of appropriateness to get this project started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And David Dobson. Good evening, Council. Um, Good, evening. Good evening. First, I made a tape of the uh, last zoning board meeting, uh, and especially on it is that questionable uh, uh, of, uh, for a developer of apartments in 
in uh, in uh, the hill section. So um, also, uh, well, there's two. You probably read them already, but I'll, I'll get to that uh, in a second. But I also have a letter here that I've written to you, and it's kind of. Uh, muddied because of my roller on my uh, my printer, but it involves Steamtown, and I I'll read it off. Please please consider a letter to appropriate congressional reps and senators regarding Steam Steamtown National Historic Site Museum. In 1994, their appropriation was 5.2 million. It hasn't been uh, given a dime more since. And in 2011, it was reduced 10%, also 10% in 2012 fiscal year. In addition, the sequester has resulted in further reductions, creating severe reductions in the ability to maintain and operate antique steam-operated engine excursions. And the result has been diminished enthusiasm for visits and tours. Many regional hotels, restaurants may suffer uh, also, as vacationers, may, uh, states may de decrease. In addition to their financial health, it may affect local tax revenues as they are tax exempt from property and employee layoffs result in less wage tax collection. Volunteers become discouraged. There's a lot of volunteers down there from lack of essential supplies and eventually discontinue participation. If needed, I can provide additional info on my phone numbers here and my name so I'll give these to Jamie and it's up to you people from there if you want to uh, also I have uh, some questions on that uh, developer that was uh, it was a stop work order on one building on Monroe Avenue, was that the bottom line on that? Um, first of all, how do you prevent people from circumventing the zoning board in the future? And can a developer sue because he was given permission? Could he sue licensing and inspections? Is this property taxable? And if that be the case, Despite the fact that they didn't go through proper channels, I'd consider maybe it'd be nice to see some taxes for a change on this. And I also have a message for uh, in watching that. I watched the whole thing in the South Side Watch. Uh, they opposed the rehab, and uh, I'm kind of tired of seeing all my county taxes going into keeping the county jail open. And it's about time we start treating drugs and alcohol like a sickness instead of uh, a criminal uh, enterprise. And, uh, okay, uh, also on the candidates, uh, the only thing I said was be careful of what you promise because you have a long road ahead. And uh, the city's in serious pro uh, financial difficulty. There is more exposed today. And if anybody thinks that they're just going to get elected and it's going to be one big party, they're seriously mistaken. I, it's, it's, uh, but I wasn't uh, indicting anybody for uh, uh, that they were worthless or, or because basically I have to support them if they get elected. And. Uh, Okay, I have a couple of uh, newspaper clippings here on Afghanistan, or uh, Syria, which we are uh, um, affording support, and I'll give you a letter next week asking you to uh, approach the uh, proper legislative people. But uh, it's a little off the offbeat, but uh, after I got home from the meeting two weeks ago, I found that a teenager was executed for blasphemy by the so-called freedom fighters in Syria. So if I could approach. Sorry. 
And there's a few things on taxes there. Also, uh, this, that makes me so Seems like some people get away with not paying their taxes for years. And, uh, but at any rate, you can keep this, uh, this tape. And if, if anybody hasn't seen it, and especially maybe Mr. Hughes would like to have somebody go over it. Because I, I would think that if, if they're going to pay taxes on those properties, it's a help uh, as opposed to having them go off the, uh, go off the uh, tax And uh, I'll, I'll make it quick, but on this with the university, um, I don't know how I feel on that because it's already tax exempt. And if you do decide to change your minds on it, make it contingent upon the building being authorized so that uh, by the uh, zoning board. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, I don't know if it's worth fighting heavily about. And the building isn't that really that beautiful. It's not a palace or anything. Uh, that's what I support is that they stay within their zone and try and work with us that way as opposed to uh, sprawling out all over the city and, and taking even more money off tax rolls. That's my idea on it. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Don't forget no. the golden parrot. Bok, bok, bok. <laughs> that concludes our sign-in sheet. Is there anyone else who cares to address council? Andy Sprague, Assistant Grant Fels, Grantonians. I'm only going to speak on agenda items. Your H on their motions has to do with leasing the senior center from Cabrini. Could you, anybody explain the rationale for that? That's a three-story building. I believe it is a lease agreement between UNC, United Neighborhood Centers, um, known as Cabrini Center and uh, the Bellevue Center uh, with the city for I believe a dollar a year for a 10-year period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at the tenant's option. Uh, I know that originally uh, the legislation that was submitted to council was the same as what had been used decades ago. Our solicitor reviewed that and got in touch with uh, the solicitor for UNC and new legislation was written that correctly represents the agreement between the city, the potential agreement between the city and UNC. But what's the rationality? We can't afford to take care of everything we already own well, without taking on more liability. Um, the, uh, I believe UNC would be providing its own insurance, and I know that Solicitor Hughes had spoken to me about, for example, uh, the roof improvements that are needed at one of the centers that will be provided by UNC, not the city of Scranton. I don't know. All I know is we can't afford to pay our own bills anywhere. We cannot take on any kind of liability at all. Anything that may cost us, we got an elevator in that building. Actually, uh, well, one is in Caprini, but one is in that section. That means you have to have an elevator contractor to take care of that elevator. I mean, you just got to look at exactly what the heck this man is doing. He's getting, he's leaving. You know that. And he's going to leave us in so much debt, we're going to sink into the, the mines. Let's go with uh, over there, Jay. Now, why do we need an emergency certificate for a man to supervise six people? It wouldn't be bad if there was like a huge amount of people. There's only six citation. We need an emergency certificate 
first of all, we didn't need him in the first place. I'm sure there was somebody in Scranton already in the administration that had enough brains to take care of six citational issuers. I mean, we get more and more ridiculous. We got a treasury that can't collect debts. We got a tax collector that can't collect taxes. Delinquencies are everywhere. What are we paying the city workers for and them departments if they can't do their job? Either we should expand them or get rid of them. Okay, let's go down to the, the 7A because that's final reading. This has to do with the handicap. You realize that a lot of people have a handicap sign just for pickup because they can't afford to walk too far. And to charge them $10 a year to renew it is ridiculous. Why don't you apply for a grant from the lottery? Who does give out them signs? If you ever went up to Garrity's, you would saw the signs of handicaps and some of them saying, given by the lottery. Let the city apply for a grant to the lottery to handle the handicap instead of figuring ways to nickel and dime the poor people that are in wheelchairs, that can't walk, probably on fixed incomes. Man, and you let everything else go. You got hundreds of people. Why don't you at least pass, if you're so looking for money so bad, pass uh, a citizen tax. After 30 days or 40 days, you become a citizen of Scranton and you have to pay the tax. And then all them kids at the U would have to pay. That was saying at the same. There's so many ways you can get around what you're doing instead of pushing more and more debt upon the city. I mean, that joke in the paper about they couldn't even adapt, add up more. We found $4 million more that we owe. That is ludicrous. But the city is ludicrous. I mean, when a cop takes a nap and gets $175,000, that is ludicrous. And the city is becoming ludicrous. And most of the people that are running the city, people are looking at them as ludicrous. You've got to get more down the brass tacks. You really do. But you can't go like you're going. You've got to look for off-the-wall things. I don't care how crazy they sound. Off-the-wall that you get more money coming in from people that can, can, can better afford to pay. And I still say you should sell electricity and take that over for the city and sell the electricity and make what you can on that to cut down the taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I long time no see. <laughs> Bob Jones, a Scranton resident. Good evening. Uh, I guess everything about the university project is pretty much out in the open. I'm not going to say much more. It's just, I think it personally, it's a good uh, negotiating tool. You know, come time to collect pilots off of them. And well, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, so I'm going to help Ron out about the traffic on Main Avenue, especially through North Scranton. Uh, it's become a super freeway now at the weather's gotten warmer and well of course I've been on the phone yelling at Marty Flynn's office about it call the cops call the cops his secretary actually said asked if I was standing outside if I could go inside because she couldn't hear me I said I am inside with the windows down that's how loud it is almost 24 7 so uh, so what I'll keep doing is just keep complaining to the cops uh, they say they pretty much can't do anything because the motorcycles are built that way and as long as they're inspected, as long as they're legal. And I can't really stress out the cops, you know, there, there's only so many cops there. And I can't keep calling them every five minutes. That's, that's, just, not, that's just not right to do either. So I'll keep bugging PennDOT about them. Uh, Marty Flynn, of course, he responded by handing me a, another uh, census survey. So thanks, Marty. That's what I needed, another census survey. Uh, also, what I wanted to help out with, uh, I saw, I went to the store on the corner of Main Market, if anybody knows where that is, and I got my stuff. And two, I'm going to call them young ladies. 
they're older, but I'm going to call them nice young ladies. They kindly asked me how to get back on the expressway. Uh, what they did was they jumped off 81 up by shifts to try and get some gas, and they saw the exit was closed to get back up on there. And they were lost. They were probably two miles down the road, and they said, follow the detour signs. And I realized there's no detour signs by there. I haven't seen any myself, so. And I said, well, you better go up this way. Well, wait a minute, that bridge is out. And they wouldn't know the way this way. And I'm trying to draw the pictures. And they didn't know the layout of the town whatsoever. So I said, follow me up. So I got them on the expressway. And just to let you guys know, but I'm, I'm just going to give a friendly call to PennDOT and say, uh, where are the detour signs out by shifts there? Because it says follow detour, and that's the last sign you see. So hopefully that'll get taken care of. And uh, like I said, whatever Ronnie says is right. Trucks do go through there about 90 miles an hour. People do drag race, and they see how loud they can get their muffler at their red light. And this happens quite often. So if any police want to sit in my driveway, it's a nice little cubby hole. They won't see you until you're right up on them, and then you can catch them and not make a liar out of me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's it. Everybody's doing a great job, and thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jim Devers. I'm the Associate Vice President for Facilities Operations at the University of Scranton. I would like to take this opportunity to clarify some concerns about the university's request for a certificate of appropriateness to demolish Leahy Hall for a new rehabilitation center project. Prior to seeking the city's permission to demolish Leahy Hall, the university seriously evaluated the potential for renovating the existing building. We hired a national consultant with extensive experience within the design of science buildings to undertake a comprehensive evaluation and feasibility study of the two interconnected buildings that make up Leahy Hall. Because of the need for adjacency and to connect to related programs in McGurn Hall, the adjacent building, one of the key factors that eliminated renovating the existing building was accommodating the three different floor levels uh, that make up Leahy Hall. A building of this type and use must be a model for accessibility given the programs that would be contained in it and the clients that it serves. In not accepting HARB's recommendation, council members mentioned that unresolved zoning issues could leave the city with an empty lot at a prominent corner. I assure you, the university has no intention of keeping an empty lot there. The center is essential to the continued success and accreditation of the occupational therapy, physical therapy, and exercise science programs. We are committed to this project. This evening, I would ask Council to reconsider its decision to approve the recommendation of the HARB. If demolition is approved now, then the university has time to address zoning requirements, which were related only to sight line variances. As this use that we propose is permitted within the current zone. I'd like to thank you for your consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding this project. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good evening, Council. My Good name evening. is Jack Figured. I'm a 57-year resident of the city of Scranton. Again, I'd like to ask you to, tonight, does anybody know anything about the Rockwell Avenue Bridge? Or have any update on it? When it's going to be raised and completed? Or I believe there's actually legislation tonight for a parcel by the Rockwell Avenue Bridge, too, that they have to acquire to finish it. Okay. Well, that but uh, apparently, I, I believe our engineer stated it was supposed to start October? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> you know, over the weekend I read an article by one of the zoning committee's spouses, Charles Newcomb. And while I was reading it, I asked myself, maybe 
the building trades in the city of Scranton aren't really getting the message out there on what we actually do. He said because we came here and spoke on the university's behalf that it was pretty much self-serving. I'd just like to address a few things that we've done as a group with the bricklayers and allied craft workers who I represent and the building trades. The projects we have done with no fanfare, no publicity, no help from Mr. Newcomb have been, we have built and maintained the Cancer Memorial Park at McDade over there in West Scranton. Through the years, some of our contractors, Sean Burns, Marble and Tile, and Matt Spots Construction has, has helped us. When Lackawanna Little League needed dugouts in a storage shed, we were there to construct it for them. When the Marvin Dutch Gap was in danger of losing their insurance because of unsafe conditions on their sidewalks and concrete works, myself and one of the Stevens boys went over there and poured that concrete at no cost to them. When the city needed concrete, a concrete pad for the children's park at Mayog, not only did we put 70 yards of concrete in there and with the help of DPW, we also got the concrete pumper to come in and give the city a great price to help us port a project. When Scranton Tomorrow decided that the park should have new fireplaces for our city residents to enjoy, myself, Mike Costello, and with the help of Scranton Building Block, who donated the materials, put those fireplaces down in the lower section where the waterfalls now stands. I'm not sure, but I could be wrong. I may have seen Charles when we did the children's park at Nayog, but it was raining so hard when we were carrying the materials around and we had a great response from the community there that you pretty much couldn't see five feet in front of yourself. But we were there doing that. Mr. Schrader, who's here tonight, his IBEW local, they installed the temporary lighting at the Italian festival with their apprentices. They used to install all the uh, temporary lighting at St. Joe's picnic when they had it. They run fundraisers for Friendship House. And if you were at uh, Marley's mission last night, you would have seen 20 of their people there installing underground services and conduits. Mr. Simpson, who's also here tonight, they renovated the gazebos at the Nag Park for the community to attend functions and have that up there. I don't know if the city charges or not for that, but they were there. They install disabled handicap ramps also, ramps also for their Lackawanna County residents, some of the Lackawanna County residents. Their contractors and members also donate time, money, and materials for habitat to humanity. This doesn't even touch on the, pro on the projects that other building trades groups do. There's 13 more. And don't touch on the individual effort our members do, such as coaches at sporting events for a little league, softball, uh, soccer. So as you can see, Charlie, we live here, we play here, we donate our time and money here. Why shouldn't we support those businesses that put our people to work? We don't only support the University of Scranton. We support the hospital projects. We support private projects that the people built. Right now with this econ economy, there's not much private stuff going on. I could sit here and tell you the same thing that Rick Schrader and Drew Simpson told you about the hardships that our memberships are going through. They're losing their homes, they're losing their health insurance, and in some cases, they're losing their families. Is this worth it? Is, is, is this something that we want to look and go forward with as a council and as members of this community? I, I think not. We have a small percentage of the people in the city that really are against everything. Uh, Mr. Schimmelfinnick, the prior business manager for the Carpenters, called them cave people. A lot of people don't know what cave people are, and every community has them. They're people afraid of change. They're citizens against virtually everything. We need to get over that. We need to back those businesses and community projects in this city and get moving forward. For those cave people that are out there, I think you should make t-shirts 
like the Legion of Doom had at one time. The only thing is, since we're so self-serving, and I'm so self-serving, that was my idea. I'd like to get the royalties from that. The second speaker spoke on how his sidewalks in front of his house or along the street were in disrepair and were abandoned vehicles, and he was pretty upset with that. You don't see that at the University of Scranton. Their streets are all done over, the sidewalks, there's period lighting, they're all manicured. You don't see that stuff going on. Mr. Bolas does great things for the city. He has a wonderful uh, project at Christmas time. Some of my members actually go up there and donate their time. He said, yeah, he said, there's no history in a parking lot, but there's no jobs and there's nothing else there either. There's only parked cars. So I would ask you, please reconsider your actions of the past, move this city forward, and let's get on with things so my members and the people in this community can just Thank you. don't suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank is you. there anyone else? This is Craig. 5A motions. Councilman McGraw, do you have any comments or motions tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, first, just to address uh, some things that were said. Um, it, it, if you're looking for black and white numbers for um, you know what the impact of the University of Scranton has has had the economic impact um, they publish an economic impact study every year um, with the amount of money that they have paid in permits fees and taxes to the city of Scranton and it's from there that I've received the information that I have um, the figures are accurate and they coincide with what uh, is you know received in the city and those numbers are if you were to take let me go back if you were to take the properties that they have bought and look at the amount of taxes that were being paid on those properties it's estimated estimate that it would take somewhere around a hundred years of hundred percent taxes on those properties to make up for what the University of Scranton has paid in permits and fees in building in, in the construction that they've done on those properties um, and also if you're looking for black and white numbers for the current project um, based on precedent and talking with members of the administration and yes with the University of Scranton um, an estimate on a $34 million construction would produce close to $1 million in revenue or monies to the city of Scranton. Um, those are black and white numbers. Um, that's what's taken place uh, over the time. Um, am I a cheerleader for the University of Scranton? Uh, yes, I'm a cheerleader for economic development in the city of Scranton. And right now, the primary developer in the city of Scranton is the University of Scranton. Um, the impact that they have had on that section of the city is enormous, not only economically, but um, socially, culturally, aesthetically. If you were to go there, if you go back 30 years and take a look at what that hill section looked like, look at what Mulberry Street was like, the changes that have taken place there are enormous. And it's all because of the, what the University of Scranton has done in being an impetus for development in that area. Um, the educational impact that the University of Scranton has had is, is um, national renown. Um, it is one of the finest schools that you can find in the Northeast, maybe in the country. And this is part of the city of Scranton. I am proud to be, if you want to call it, a cheerleader for the University of Scranton. I think that they have had an enormous positive impact on the city of Scranton. Um, I'm proud to have a degree from the University of Scranton. I'm proud to say that I was employed by the University of Scranton. And I'm proud to say to anybody coming, I'm proud to take anyone who comes into this city and take them to the University of Scranton and show them what we have. Um, it's impressive, 
and I think it's something that we should all support. It is, and the project that's before us, or that was before us, um, I think was um, something that we should have supported. Uh, there was no loss to the city whatsoever. There was nothing, there was no loss in taxes. There was, I don't know what you could say that was, the only thing that was going to happen was a square brick building was going to be taken down. Just because it was old doesn't make it historic. Um, and, and Harb pretty much agreed that, yes, take the building down. What's going to be there afterwards is going to be much better and much better for the city. Um, I hope that we do um, reintroduce this and I hope that we do um, reconsider so that this, that project can move forward. Um, and as far as the name calling uh, is concerned, uh, we really don't need to do that. Uh, this is a business meeting and when you start to make things personal, it's, um, it's really unnecessary. Um, another note, uh, I did attend a meeting with, um, with representatives from, what is it, Jenny Montgomery Scott um, this past week. Um, all I can say is that there is progress in um, talks and deliberations as far as paying the, or borrowing for the payment of the um, court award or the arbitration, the back pay, and also the pension MMO. Um, one of the problems that was encountered is that as of yet, there is not a set figure for what the back pay would be. Uh, it, it's pretty tough to pay a bill when you don't know how much the bill is. And uh, until there's, from the audit conducted by the, I believe by the unions, until that's finalized, um, I don't think that we can really move forward in uh, addressing that. Um, also at the Pell, uh, there was a meeting with Pell, same ideas were discussed and again, uh, I didn't have a chance to but uh, talk with Mr. Joyce, but uh, as of now, the cash flow for the city of Scranton is still um, relatively good. Uh, I believe that the cash on hand, and I've, I'm sorry that I didn't get this to you before, was somewhere around 10 point, is it 10.9 million? And uh, accounts payable were at zero. So uh, as of now, the you know, status uh, of the city was looking pretty good uh, you know, moving forward. Um, and last, a uh, couple of things. Uh, there was a let, we received a letter of commendation from uh, for the, a couple of DPW workers who went to a, a residence that had been, a place that had been demolished and the neighbors were thankful and wishing to thank the DPW for coming and cleaning up after the demolition. Um, and uh, again, uh, you know, just a thank you to the members of the DPW for doing that work. And also there was a letter from um, Chief Graziano addressing a couple of issues that were brought up. I don't know if Mr. Laskin was going to mention those, but um, yeah, would you rather? I, I don't know. But you can. Uh, it was just uh, there were some questions. One was um, the paving or the um, lines on Meadow Meadow Avenue uh, and River Street uh, in front of the Clarion and all. And what was uh, said was that there's an intent to pave the, those blocks of Meadow Avenue and they didn't want to paint lines prior to it being repaved and then have to go back and redo it. So hopefully that area will be paved shortly and that the appropriate lines, uh, traffic lines will be um, then painted. As far as the lot at the bottom of East Mountain Road and 
I guess top of River Street, across from Salvation Army, it was found that that's private property and that as far as anyone parking there or people driving ATVs in there, um, there's nothing that could be done uh, un unless the owners of the property were to file a complaint. Um, and I do know that there are, num there are some people that use that as a, a meeting place for carpooling and that they do park there. I, I don't know that that's been a problem for anyone, but, um, but that is private property. And the last one, uh, the traffic sign on, or the no truck sign on Seymour Avenue or uh, I guess it says actually on Duncan or uh, Snook Street, I'm sorry, um, Snook Street uh, that I think Ms. Schumacher talked about that it's only, there's only one sign. Apparently, uh, Scranton Police and others were unable to find why that sign was there in the first that, you know, it was there, but they never really enforced it uh, because there is no other sign, there's no sign on any other side of the um, the mountain or of the street, so it's difficult to uh, determine why they're. They said it's difficult to determine why that sign was placed there, um, and that they were going to research the matter, and that's all. And Councilman Rogan, do you have comments or motions? Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I'll first start off with um, the issue regarding Leahy Hall. Um, as I think most everyone knows, um, I fully support this project. And my support is, is for a few reasons, and I, I'd like to reiterate some of those reasons. Um, the first one being, and this is where some of the criticism of the university comes, this property already takes this project will take place on a property that is already tax exempt. The University of Scranton is not taking any additional property off the tax rolls by moving forward with this project. If this had been a plan where the university was purchasing many properties, tearing them down, taking them off the tax rolls, um, I would have to give it a much harder look. But that isn't the case. This property is already owned by the University of Scranton and it's already used as, as part of their facilities. Secondly, this will bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue directly into the city. Now, I know many others, and, and Mr. McGough talked about the multiplying effect of money in the city, and that's all very real. But at a bare minimum, this will bring in $445,000 in building permits. Then on top of that, you add mercantile tax that comes in on this project. On top of that, you add um, wage tax paid to the local unionized workers that are doing this project. And for me, when you add all those things together, it, it really becomes something very good for the city of Scranton. So that being said, I would like to make a motion to reconsider accepting the certificate of appropriateness from HARB regarding Leahy Hall and placing it back on the agenda. Second. And on the question, um, two reasons why I would like to bring this back up. First one is that I support it. I wasn't Unfortunately, two members weren't here the day of this final vote. Um, and I think taking this from day one, put it back on the agenda in fifth order, let it play through for three votes where we could get input not only from folks from the University of Scranton, from neighbors, folks in the construction industry, from everyone, and, uh, and make an informed decision. I'll speak a little bit about this <clears throat> since I wasn't here. In no way, shape, or form am I a fan of the University of Scranton or a cheerleader for the University of Scranton. I think that they have made a lot of changes in the city. I think that they have improved the city, but I think the main benefit was to improve the University of Scranton not to improve the city of Scranton, to make their college more attractive. I think they can be contributing more in pilots. However, I think in this instance, one, the building in question is already tax exempt. Two, the city is struggling for money. 
and we do need that revenue. Any revenue that we could generate would be helpful. And at this point, I would reconsider voting on the issue since I, have, since I was not here to vote the first time. I don't, I see a lot of opportunities for the jobs it could create, uh, for the electricians union, for the carpenters union, for the bricklayers and the iron workers. We've had their representatives come up and speak to us, and they have concerns. They have members living in the city, working here, contributing and paying taxes, people that need jobs, people that are struggling. And this project would bring some of those jobs to them, hopefully. So for, for that reason alone, I'll vote to reintroduce it, if we could, if this is something that's even legal. If I could, uh, I, I just have a few comments. I was going to wait till motions, but uh, since we're on the question regarding this. No one's been accused more of being pro-union on this board than myself. And I take favor in that, because I am. I think every working man should be protected. And it's brought us to where we are today. But the problem is, this is not about the unions. Don't turn this issue around. And it's not about the university at this point. It's about the rules and regulations. We're not asked to approve a building. We're asked to tear down a building. That's our approval. That's not going to benefit the bricklayers at this point. It's up to the zoning board to give their approval for that. It may benefit a, a landfill where all the bricks go and stuff like that from the building. Uh, unfortunately, that's the only thing we have the ability to vote on right now. So to come to us and say, we're going to have all this economic development because you're going to vote to tear down a building doesn't necessarily provide that. I, love, I would love to see everybody working in this city. I love the university. I said I have family members that graduated from there. But the problem is, yes, they have given us a positive impact, but not on our tax base. You know, a lot of properties have been gobbled up. We have to look at the, our tax, the, the people we represent, our taxpayers, too. That's not at issue here. What is at issue here is what I've seen over the last couple of weeks has been, uh, I don't know, and I'm not accusing the university of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying there is a culture of circumventing rules over the past several years here that are slowly coming to light. With the zoning office, uh, we, we have the videotape now, but if, if anybody saw that meeting, we know what happened there. They've given certificates of nonconformity. There's, pe you know, there, there's people that are insiders that know how to do it, and there's people on the outside. The university is, has, has done first-class buildings, and like Mr. Joyce said, it's to their benefit. I mean, I agree. I think, personally, I don't think that building that they have there is feasible for them, and I think a new building is the most feasible. But I have to go by what was put in front of me by the boards that we have. First of all, the zoning board rejected their plans. The hard board, although everybody is saying they approved it, I've, I'm hearing a lot of different issues. That's where I'm getting this culture of circumventing rules, because I don't believe they had a full panel when they voted. I received an email. I've also been in some conversations. And I'll read this email, but I'm not going to mention the person's name. Good evening. As a member of Scranton's Historic Architectural Review Board, I wanted to alert you to the University of Scranton's proposed demolition of the YWCA building located on the corner of Jefferson Avenue and Linden Street. This building is considered a landmark structure and is supposed to be protected by the HARB. We had the opportunity to review this project at our most recent meeting, May 13th, with only partial board attendance. As it stands now, a vote in favor of demolition contingent on mitigation of historic elements was narrowly approved. Most members do not support the demolition of this structure. I felt compelled to email you in advance of legislation regarding this matter. Our architectural heritage is our community's strongest asset and demolition 
should be given very careful consideration. I urge you to table your vote on this matter pending HARB's review of the university's mitigation plan. By doing so, HARB will have the opportunity to re-vote on this important legislation in presence of all its members in favor of preservation and against demolition. Thank you for your time. So, you know, we're in the middle here. We have to represent all sides, and, and it's tough because nobody wants to see guys out there working and new construction in this town more than me. But again, we have to follow what's in black and white. And, and, and the culture that I've seen that has been open to my eyes scares me. We could be up for litigation, and that's something I don't want. Do I want to see a new building there? Personally, I do. Do I feel I have the right to, to, to well, we don't have the right to vote on a new building. All we have the right to vote on is to tear one down. Based on what I've heard from, from certain members of HARB, it seems like the majority is against it, but they set up a meeting just like Mr. Rogan is asking tonight to, to vote again. I'd be in favor of bringing it up. That doesn't mean it won't be voted down or it will be voted down, but I, I'm definitely, if they want to bring it up, that's fine. It'll be voted on again by us. But our vote is only on the demolition of that building. So you should go to HARB. You should go to the zoning board and pursue them with your issues. The only issue we have in front of us is the ability to give them the right to tear this building down. And again, I, I feel there's a certain urgency for some reason. I don't know why, because they still have to appeal the zoning decision and that may take some time. So, I don't know. Is the urgency because not enough people voted on it? I don't know. Same urgency we have tonight here, to vote on it. So. Um, with regard to that uh, letter, and I had received several as well, it also appeared that those who attended that particular meeting that was mentioned by Councilman Loscombe, some were members who had not attended meetings, hard meetings, in a very, very long time and made one appearance to cast this vote, while others who are regular members in good standing were not present. Um, that concerns me. And I do agree with uh, the comments made by my colleague, Councilman Loscombe. What also is a bit curious to me is the fact that it's come to my attention that United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania uh, is using a construction company, a contractor that doesn't pay all of its employees area standards wages, including either providing or making payments for health care and pension ben benefits. Yet, I've not heard from any of the labor leaders about their great opposition to a project located at 629 Cedar Avenue. Um, I Zellins, don't know. How, how is this I'm, relevant to the motion? I'm speaking. We're, we're on the question of the motion. Your objection is noted. I am speaking. Now, I don't know that there's anything City Council can do about that. But if there is, we'd certainly like to know. But there hasn't been one word mentioned by any of the labor leaders. I remember as well, uh, I was not here for the vote because my mother was dying at the time. But this council approved, I believe, a LERDA agreement for uh, a building on Dixon Avenue. Had I been here, I would not have approved it because I am not in agreement with KOZs, KOEZs, and the LERTA program. However, what I learned afterwards was that some of the people brought in for that project were not local workers, despite the best efforts of the Scranton School Board and I believe the intentions of Scranton City Council. But again, I didn't see labor leaders coming before Scranton City Council on that issue. Um, I certainly, I too, 
am a union supporter. I have been a member of the American Federation of Teachers for 25 plus years. So I am a strong union person. And like Mr. Loscombe, I do not see this issue as a union issue. I see this as an issue between the zoning board and the University of Scranton. I would assume the university will file an appeal in court and if successful, then council can reconsider this um, particular piece of legislation. I certainly would not be opposed to that. But as it stands right now, there's a great push on to put the cart before the horse and to ask Scranton City Council to bypass or ignore the importance of the Scranton Zoning Board and its decisions. And uh, just as I would not expect the Zoning Board to um, create a conflict for Scranton City Council, I don't believe that Scranton City Council should be creating one for the Zoning Board. I think it needs to take its proper course of action, which is an appeal in the courts. Um, just a few points on that. Um, I look at this issue and the zoning issue as two completely separate issues. The zoning issue is for a site variance, which is a lot more, I would say, is a lot more common than a use variance and a lot more easier to obtain. But again, I agree that we shouldn't step on their toes and they shouldn't step on ours. I respect the zoning board's decision. I may not agree with it, but I respect it. But by not allowing the demolition of the building to begin, then the University of Scranton can't change their plans to conform, either conform to the current zoning or appeal. Um, I'm sure plans can be changed to conform and to get this project up and, you know, up and moving. And for me, it is an issue of jobs. It, that, that's, that's what it is. The economy is terrible over the last four or five years. And, you know, hearing the stories from union representatives, and not only union representatives, but just average Scrantonians who are out of work, who don't have health care. And I think this is an opportunity where city council could do something to get the ball rolling on this project to create some jobs, bring revenue into the city, and not take taxpayer properties off the tax rolls. Um, there's no secret the University of Scranton wants to expand, and that's certainly a debate that we need to have. But if the University of Scranton wants to expand upwards on their own property, that's something I will always support. When it comes to purchasing new property off the tax rolls, that's where I think we need to negotiate other terms. But as far as this project goes, um, hopefully we can reconsider it and there's no rush you know get started I believe it will start back in fifth order as new legislation so it would have three readings members of HARB would have the chance to come to the podium and speak to us folks from the University of Scranton would have a chance to speak to us folks from the unions would have a chance to speak to us and just average Scrantonians um, so I think bringing it up for for another vote is certainly the right way to go and um, Hopefully it will garner three votes. Thank you. Mr. Rogan, could I just ask you a quick question? Uh, sure. Do I understand you said that they can't go for a variance until the building is down? Is that what you're saying? No. If, if we don't knock, not us, if the University of Scranton can't do the demolition, they can't proceed with plan, contingency plans to conform to zoning. They could build there currently. It would just have to con conform with the site variance. That's a paper plan. All they have to do is show them on paper what their plan is. That, get, that gets approval. They don't need a building down to get the approval for the plan with the site distance. Well, I'm sure there's, there's a, a, a large cost associated with the changing of those plans. I don't think, and I'm not speaking for the university, but I wouldn't see them making that change until they, they knew the project could go through. It's, it doesn't make sense. The building, the building could stand as it is, and the plans could be developed to, to address the zoning issue and continue at this place, at this point. It certainly can, but that would that would. Slow. All we're giving approval for is to tear a building down. Nothing with the zoning. That's exactly right. 
The zoning has nothing to and do with the tearing of the building down right now. I don't believe is going to hold up anything. The non-tearing of the building now, because they, like I said, they can't tear it down until they get approval to, for another building if they have students there. Well, so we're just, it, it just seems to me that there's a, a certain amount of urgency for no reason to do that. And I don't know what it is. Like I said, for, for go ahead, Mr. McGough. I, I think it's obvious what it is. They'd like to begin construction on a new building. Well, what, and, if, what if the zoning and takes can't. six months? That's my point. We could approve this in, in two meetings, two weeks. As simple as that. Yes. What's the urgency? It's still not going to give these guys a job until they get the approval to build a building. That's my point. What's the urgency? Can, that, can anyone answer that for me? You have to take step one. Mr. Devers, you take step two. what is the urgency that this building has to be torn down immediately and you don't have an approved plan from zoning? Tearing this building down uh, at this time, it's going to take about two to three months to tear this building down. We then have to get in there and do shoring and site preparation work. We want to avoid pouring concrete in the winter months by doing so. And now we'll have to delay it. We may even have to delay, I don't know. We have to talk to our construction manager. But we may have to delay this project until the spring time. That's going to put us back almost a year. For this project to be completed. Now we have other issues, uh, sort of uh, as uh, as I said before. We're looking to occupy this building for the fall semester of 2015. And right now we're tight on that schedule. Our construction manager has developed a schedule which incorporates the demolition of Lake Hall as well as the new construction, site preparation, and so forth. We then have to furnish the building and test the building out. So we need to have this building ready for the fall semester of 2015. A one-year delay is going to be critical to us. There may be accreditation issues with the occupational therapy program, the physical therapy program will come into play. And we have, we have uh, uh, notified those boards that we are moving forward with a plan to build a new building for those programs. So that's the urgency. Okay. Uh, we're not going to, we can address the zoning issues. The zoning issues are very simple to address. We need a certificate of appropriateness as a demolition of late call so that we can get started on this problem project. Every day to us is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't normally allow anyone from the audience to speak once the, uh, this portion of the meeting that, has begun, though. but I thank you for the information. Mrs. Craig, did we ever receive the, the minutes from the HARB meeting? No. We requested them? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion passes. Thank you very much. I think this is a good first step towards making this project come to be and get more people in our area working again. Next, this wasn't an issue that I was planning on addressing tonight, but Mr. Spraglia brought up some very good points. Um, I would like to make a motion to table item 7A regarding the handicapped parking areas. Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. Just to elaborate, um, I do agree with the intent of this ordinance. I definitely think the handicap parking placards around the city, there needs to be a way to control um, getting them back. Once the person moves, or if they, unfortunately they pass away, um, there are many handicap placards in the city that are in properties where it really shouldn't be. Um, I fully support coming up with an initiative to keep track of that and some sort of registration. Um, but I, I really think Mr. Spragley brought up, brought up a good point 
by trying to get a state grant to pay for this instead of charging the $10 fee. Um, I, I believe, you know, the lottery, and, and that's the, probably the place to go since, you know, most people that have a handicap plaque are, are older Scrantonians and older Pennsylvanians, and that's what the lottery plant, the lottery um, proceeds are set aside for. So that may be something that, that should be looked into. Um, hopefully it will. And also I would like to see an exemption if, if there was a fee for disabled veterans who have disabled veteran handicap license plates. Um, so hopefully there are items that could be, I wish it was tabled, but hopefully there are items that can be looked into in the future. I do have comments on numerous agenda items. Um, I will wait to comment on those until they come up. I do have just two requests for tonight. The first one is the corner of the 300 block of North Bromley and Swetland Street. There's a property, a block from where I live, um, that somebody began de demolition on about a month ago. And after a few days of work, the roof was torn off and then they just stopped. Um, the, the property looks very dangerous. Um, there are gutters hanging. There are other parts of the property hanging. The sidewalks are fenced off around this property, but it seems stagnant for about a month now. So Mrs. Craig, if it's agreeable to everyone, can we please send a letter to LIPS um, to look into this situation? It is very dangerous looking, um, and especially with thunder th uh, thunderstorms and, and high winds this time of year, it's definitely something that hopefully can be addressed quickly. Also, can we please send a letter to the DPW requesting that potholes on the 3,000 block of Division Street are filled? And that is all until the agenda items come up. Thank you. And Councilman Loscom, do you have any comments or motions? Oh, yes. I forgot I, that was on the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to address, uh, just briefly, uh, we spoke about the university and that, but uh, Representative Haggerty's letter in the paper today, uh, since it was brought up, and it's, it's very nice that he mentioned Providence, Rhode Island, because I, I just want to give you a little difference between Scranton and Providence, Rhode Island. The city of Scranton covers 26.3 square miles. Providence, Rhode Island covers 20 square miles. However, they have over twice as many taxpayers in Providence, Rhode Island. But in March of 2012, and this is something that Mr. Haggerty should follow up on if he represents all of us, uh, I'll provide him with the information and the paperwork. In March, of, March 2012, state legislators in Rhode Island submitted a bill that would allow municipalities to charge nonprofit educational institutions and hospitals an assessment of 25% of the taxes they would have been charged had their property been fully taxable. Characterizing the charge as an essential services fee, a reason cited was the financially struggling Providence, sound like Scranton? was unable to win satisfactory payments in lieu of taxes from several major tax-exempt institutions in the city. The bill is still undecided, but such pieces of legislation will determine the fate of the nonprofit property tax exemption in the long run. But with that in effect, they made an agreement. In 2012, Providence received $23 million from their nonprofits. What do we receive? Do we receive a million? No. All, all in all? No. It's, it, it's, it's very interesting. But if Mr. Haggerty wants to put his money where his mouth is and help the city, I'll provide him with this information. Maybe he could take a trip with me to Rhode Island and we could see how it's done. But uh, again, you know, we have taxpayers that we represent too. So we have to provide that equal balance there. And that's why I'm here. And I think that's, uh, bear with, oh, I had one more, one more issue, if I could find it here. And again, unfortunately, and, and I'm on a kick lately about circumventing the rules, uh, I happened to get a letter from one of my constituents that a property of 1421 Rundle Street, the residents report this work was begun without permits or plans submitted to LIPS. After bringing this to LIP's attention for three days, a stop work order was issued. The owner of the property has remarked to other neighbors that this will be an apartment which is not allowed in a residential zone. Residents request that this 
property owner who is a police officer follow all rules and regulations and apply for the necessary variances permits and submit plans before any further work is done at this address I don't have a name who sent this but they provided me with photos so I'll make sure that uh, that lips follows up on that nobody is above the rules and regulations here let's all follow them and things will be much better for all of us in the long run and that's all I have to say thank you thank you councilman Joyce do you have comments or motions yes um, I first would like to start out by apologize or apologizing for my absence two weeks ago I had a family emergency and uh, last week I happened to be feeling ill and was unable to make the meeting uh, which resulted in the lack of a quorum I want to give everybody an update uh, where we are as of the end of June being that it's approaching in regard to taxes collected by the single tax office council received some information as of June 30th of 2012 at that from at during that period of time from uh, January to the end of June of 2012 the city had collected 10 million six oh six eight eighty nine fifty nine during the same period this year the city collected thirteen million fifty four thousand seventy seven dollars and forty four cents which is an increase of two million four hundred forty seven dollars or four hundred forty seven thousand one hundred eighty seven dollars and eighty eight cents which is a twenty three point oh seven percent increase now this is in line with the tax increase that was uh, passed with the passing of the um, 2013 operating budget so uh, when you look at where we are or where we were last year compared to where we were this year we're in line with the percentage increase actually a percentage point ahead uh, delinquent real estate taxes uh, last year at as of the end of June the city collected 419,972.10 as of the end of June for this year the city had collected 431,238.43 which is an increase of eleven thousand two hundred two hundred sixty six dollars and thirty three cents which is a two point six eight percent increase um, the local service tax uh, as of June 30th of last year the city collected seven hundred fifty nine thousand forty four dollars and fifty eight cents as of the end of this year or sorry the end of June of this year the city had collected eight hundred nineteen thousand nine thirty eight twenty nine which is an increase of sixty thousand eight ninety three seventy one which is an eight point oh two percent increase uh, the business privilege and mercantile taxes as of 630 2012 the city had collected 1 million six hundred five thousand seven sixty nine fifty four as of 630 2013 the city had collected 1 million nine hundred thirty nine thousand eight dollars and seventy three cents this is an increase of thirty three thousand or three hundred thirty three thousand Two thirty-nine nineteen, or an increase of twenty point seven five percent. This is above uh, the tax increase that was imposed uh, in the um, two thousand and thirteen operating budget. So, so far it looks like we're trending pretty well with real estate tax collection and business privilege and mercantile tax collection, and we're seeing increases in the uh, LST collections and delinquent real estate tax as well. <clears throat> as Mr. McGough stated earlier, um, the city currently has about ten point nine million dollars cash on hand and has zero dollars in accounts payable. So that is a uh, positive sign as well um, next time I'll, I'll speak about the university for, for a second um, outside of the um, vote to put the um, resolution back on the agenda I just want to talk about pilots for a second mr. Loscombe brought up a good point about Providence Rhode Island 
And I think it's time for the nonprofits in this area to step up and take the challenge and be leaders in helping this city. Because currently, the residents of this city are definitely overtaxed and they can't afford to pay much more. And with the Supreme Court award looming in the background, unfortunately, if we don't receive a commuter tax or other alternate sources of revenue, there's not much else left besides tax increases because the state limits what types of taxes can, that can be or imposed on its residents. So I'd like to challenge the university and I'd like to challenge other nonprofits to contribute more to the city. The city needs it. The city, the city desperately needs your help. <clears throat> I do have one citizen's request for tonight in uh, regard to um, the exit of Jay's Commons. Um, I received a, um, an issue from uh, a resident with traffic coming out of Jay's Commons creating a disturbance on Main Avenue um, regarding traffic patterns. And also the resident uh, informed me that the gate in the back of Jay's Commons is permanently closed. Uh, Mrs. Crake, if we could please contact, I'm, I'm not sure who the appropriate party would be for this, um, to investigate the situation. Uh, perhaps we could do some research and find out who the appropriate party would be for this situation. And that's all I have for tonight. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I just forgot one. I think, it, you know, it, it, it says a lot. Uh, one statement that I forgot to state on the uh, pilots, and Mr. Joy speaking about them reminded me. But uh, I do have a letter to the agreement from Providence College's president regarding their pilot agreement to their students. And it's a pretty lengthy letter, but there's a, a very important part of this letter. It says, mindful of the city's willingness to structure these agreements on a quid pro quo basis, here we're called extortionists, up there it's a quid pro quo, pro. they got a little bit of a parking area. Uh, and knowing that they were hopeful of striking some type of arrangement with all of the major nonprofit institutions in Providence. But I just thought that was important because the news media up there tells it the right way and the news media here distorts what our intentions are so yes and we actually I had reported on Providence last year quite extensively yes, as it. had our solicitor and uh, much of the success that they experienced were, had been due to the efforts of their mayor the city was facing bankruptcy and the mayor reached out to the nonprofits and was quite successful. But I would wonder also, were any of these nonprofits suing Providence, Rhode Island <laughs> at the same time as they were uh, looking yes. for quid pro quo? Mrs. Evans, I, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, I received a message. Um, it was mentioned about the letter to the editor that was in the paper. I just wanted to state that was not written by the husband of the zoning board member. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And City Council's agenda tonight includes two emergency certificates which were submitted on June 26th and 27th by the administration. The first certificate is for immediate approval of item 5J which authorizes the mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into a management agreement with Republic Parking System, the lowest responsible bidder for parking meter management. The current month-to-month -month agreement with Standard Parking will terminate on June 30th, 2013, and the contract with Republic Parking System will begin on July 1st, 2013. Consequently, in order to prevent a lapse in management, the legislation requires immediate approval. 
In addition, Council Solicitor Hughes attended several meetings with Republic and the administration, participated in the drafting of this legislation, and advises City Council to provide its approval tonight. The second certificate is for disbursement of up to $20,000 from the UDAG repayment account for payment of an audit of the Scranton Parking Authority. Such audit is required to complete the 2012 independent audit of the City of Scranton and to obtain financing for payment of the Supreme Court award to police and fire. Again, Solicitor Hughes advises Council to advance and approve this legislation during tonight's meeting. Also, Solicitor Hughes, an authority in eminent domain cases, thoroughly reviewed agenda item 5E, which authorizes acquisition by eminent domain of a parcel affected by the Rockwell Avenue Bridge Repair Project Supplemental Agreement and Federal Project and he approves of it. Next, items 5H and 5I include lease agreements with United Neighborhood Centers Cabrini and Bellevue Centers for a 10-year period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at the tenant's option. Both ordinances were reviewed and revised by Solicitor Hughes and his corrections have been included. Yesterday, our council staff informed me that two alternate positions on the Scranton Zoning Board will expire on July 1st. Since council members did not agree on appointments or could not be reached, appointments of alternates could not be included in tonight's agenda. Consequently, rather than renewing terms or choosing from the pool of previous applicants for permanent positions, Council will ask for applicants, again, city residents who wish to serve as alternates must submit letters of interest and resumes to the Office of City Council either by mail or hand delivery on or before July 8, 2013. Information submitted by email will not be eligible for consideration. Mrs. Evans, mm -hmm. uh, people who had submitted um, resumes for the two permanent positions. Mm -hmm. If they wish to also be considered for the alternates, can they just call the office and have them certainly move the? I'd be very, I'd be very pleased. So to they have don't have to submit happen. a second. Yes. Resume. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally. I'd like to welcome all Pennsylvania American Federation of Teachers members to their annual convention, which will be held in downtown Scranton this weekend and hosted by our own SFT president, Rosemary Boland, and proud SFT members. Um, at this time, I'd like to read a letter that was drafted by our assistant city uh, clerk, Ms. Carrera, and we thank her for doing so on our behalf. Scranton City Council welcomes the American Federation of Teachers of Pennsylvania. The AFTPA 2013 convention, the future of our union, will be held in Scranton at the Hilton Hotel and Conference Center beginning Friday, June 28th through Sunday, June 30th, 2013. Elections for state officers and executive council members will be held on Saturday. The AFTPA is a union of professionals whose work is done to benefit education in the state of Pennsylvania. They are committed to creating a positive learning experience for children throughout our state and are advocates of the public school system and all of its employees. The AFTPA is acutely aware of the challenges they face going forward, attacks on the institutions they serve, on their collective bargaining rights, their financial security, and their middle class way of life. And I believe this will be presented to President Boland during the convention. 
And uh, I can say again, as a 25-year union member of the AFT, I'm particularly pleased by the great honor awarded to our local Scranton Federation of Teachers in conducting this very prestigious convention. And that's it. 5B, amending section 340-1, 340-8, 340-9, and 340-13A of the Code of the City of Scranton, governing peddling and soliciting within the City of Scranton. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Other question? All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5C, establishing the duties, responsibilities, and qualifications of the city health inspector, providing for the payment of an annual license fee for public eating and drinking establishments within the city of Scranton, establishing annual application and renewal requirements, imposing certain duties upon the director of licensing, inspections, and permits, and the city health inspector, providing guidelines for revocation and reinstatement of licenses, and providing for imposition of penalties. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5C be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5D, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse $30,000 from the account into which repayment of Urban Development Action Grants, UDAG, are deposited UDAG repayment account for the Connell Park and Novembrino swimming pools to be opened in time for the 2013 swimming season. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5D be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yeah, I just, uh, in, in driving by both of those pools, it doesn't appear that either is going to be ready for the 2013 swimming season. Um, both seem to be in great disrepair. So um, hopefully, you know, hopefully the $30,000 can get that accomplished, but I'm not I sure that you. that's going to happen. I know. Would the, you prefer to table it? Uh, I would hope that, uh, no, I, I would like to move it forward. I, I would hope that, you know, with this investment that we can do something to repair those and at least partial, have a partial season at those pools. Okay. I, I would add, I, I drive by Novembrino pool almost every day and I know for probably a year now there's been a, a wooden pallet yeah. in the back corner. Yeah, I don't I know if anyone else has seen that. And you could see some crumbling in, in that area. And hopefully, like Mr. McGough said, hopefully this is enough money to get the pools open, but if it isn't, I would hope it would be used for permanent repairs that could get them at the very least up and running for, for the following year. Yes. So I, I do think we should approve it. Yes. I agree. And um, just as a reminder, any um, disbursement of the UDAG re-refunds uh, has to be made by Scranton City Council and can be used for only the specified purposes. Right. So. Um, those funds, even in the event that the two additional pools fail to open this summer, cannot be used for any other purpose. And if they could provide a list of expenditures with that? Mm hmm Thank you. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5E, authorizing the acquisition by eminent domain of the parcel affected by the Rockwell Avenue Bridge Repair Project, Supplemental Agreement Number 04122-C and Federal Project Number 117-X042-060. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that Item 5E be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5F, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a lease agreement with the Northeast Inspection Consultants, NEIC, 
for the former supply room in the licensing, inspections, and permits fourth floor of the City Hall to be used for third party inspections. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5F be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. A second. Other question? I believe that um, NEIC has been utilizing uh, that supply room since January 2013, and they are paying um, a monthly rent to the city of $500. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5G, sale of tax delinquent property, more commonly known as 2314 Pittston Avenue, tax map number 16714010046, Scranton, Pennsylvania, to George J. Langan, Jr., 2313 Pittston Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, for the consideration of $5,000. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5G be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. And the question? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5H, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to enter into a lease agreement with United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania, known as the Cabrini Center, located at 1004 Jackson Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for a 10-year period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at tenant's option. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5H be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5I, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate officials of the city of Scranton to enter into a lease agreement with the United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania, known as the Bellevue Center, located at 531 Emmett Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, for a 10-year period with three successive 10-year renewal terms at tenant's option. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5A be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question, all those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5J, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into a management agreement with Republic Parking System to administer and manage the city's on-street parking meter operation, procure on-street parking meter equipment, enforce violations of city on-street parking meter ordinances, employ personnel to administer and enforce the city's on-street metered parking operation, prepare and deliver to the city a budget every year for city approval, deposit gross receipts for <coughs> monies collected and earned by Republic into a federally insured bank account in exchange for the sum of $5,000 per month for a period of five years beginning July 1, 2013 and ending on June 30, 2018 emergency certificate attached. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5J be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. <coughs> Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. Um, I will vote yes for this legislation in fifth order. Um, I strongly disagree with the emergency certificate. This, is, this legislation is the spending of $300,000 um, over the next five years. And I do think it would be proper, as we did with standard parking, um, to have a caucus and to have them come in to answer questions from council. Um, if this happened last, you know, if this, this exact scenario played out with standard, it would have been approved. I know that that caucus, at least for me, and I, I think for everyone on the board, was eye-opening that they, they weren't the right firm for the city. Um, well, and and I, I know the argument is going to be made that we'll, we wouldn't have um, a management firm, but that's already happened when the parking authority went under. And the, the city employee, they became city employees for that short period of time. Uh, actually, it was not the caucus, I think, that engendered um, uh, the bidding of the contract. It was the fact that no bidding of the contract occurred. And as a result, the process was postponed now for 
nearly six months and the city has fall, fallen behind on parking meter and citation revenue uh, as a result. Uh, we're not up to where our projection should be because we delayed the process, rightfully so, because we were seeking to have it bid and we have now the lowest responsible bidder who has been in talks with, as I said, the administration, the city clerk, our city, our city council solicitor, and I think it's important that we get moving on this so that the city isn't losing that revenue. All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. 5K, appointing Alan O'Neill, Rear 1440 Church Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508, as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. O'Neill will replace Lance Stangy Jr., whose term expires on July 1, 2013. Alan O'Neill's term will commence on July 2, 2013, and expire on July 1, 2018. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5K be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, on the question. How were these two picks uh, made and by whom were they made? This particular selection of Mr. O'Neill was made by me. I have had only one appointment to the zoning board uh, during this four-year term, uh, whereas most of my colleagues have had two appointments. So on the rotational basis, it became my turn for an appointment. Anyone else? All those in favor of introduction signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. 5L, appointing Sean Walsh, 2821 Cedar Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Scranton. Mr. Walsh will replace Mary Ann Wardell, whose term expires on July 1, 2013. Sean Walsh's term will commence on July 2, 2013 and expire on July 1, 2018. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5L be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Uh, the question? Yes, same question as the first one. This, this one was my appointment, my second appointment. and. As much as I, I believe Mrs. Wardell has done a fantastic job, and, and I would definitely vote to keep her on, but I had made a commitment a while ago that my next appointment, uh, I made a commitment to this gentleman that my next appointment would be him, so I don't know, you know, how they fall. So I would hope that uh, to be able to see Mrs. Wardell on there again, but that, that's my explanation. Thank you, and I'd I also like to mention, uh, I'll support the appointment, but Mrs. Wardell, I believe, did a great job on the board, um, even though, even in this one of these recent decisions, I didn't, I disagreed with her, but she was always very thorough and very fair. And the same could be said for Mr. Stange. Um, and it's unfortunate that um, they'll both be leaving the board. I do um, agree with you. And I too, Mr. Stange, though, as I mentioned at a previous meeting, submitted uh, his letter of resignation. Uh, he was not interested in serving an additional term. He had been my appointment, uh, my one and only appointment to the zoning board. Um, as for the alternates that I mentioned earlier, there are two positions that are becoming available as of July 1st, and I believe those appointments would belong to Councilman Rogan and Councilman Joyce. And, um, you know, I'd like to have that ready from both of you for the July 11th meeting, and certainly, um, Mr. Rogan, you can, uh, if you so choose, nominate and appoint uh, Mrs. Wardell mm -hmm. as your choice for alternate. Thank you. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, and so moved. Emergency Certificate 5M, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse funds in an amount not to exceed $20,000 from the account into which repayment of Urban Development Action Grants, UDAG, are deposited, UDAG repayment account, 
in order to finance the cost of an audit of the Scranton Parking Authority to be performed by McGrail, Merkel, Quinn, and Associates, PC, for the purposes of completing the 2012 City of Scranton audit. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5M be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. On the question. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. I make a motion to suspend the rules to move items 5J and 5M to 6th and 7th order to be considered for final passage based on the attached emergency certificates. Second. 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 Are the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so moved. 6th order 6A, formerly 5J. Reading by title. File of Council Number 31, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into a management agreement with Republic Parking System to administer and manage the city's on-street parking meter operation, procure on-street parking meter equipment, enforce violations of city on-street parking meter ordinances, employ personnel to administer and enforce the city's on-street metered parking operation, Prepare and deliver to the city a budget every year for city approval. Deposit gross receipts from monies collected and earned by Republic into a federally insured bank account in the exchange for the sum of $5,000 per month for a period of five years beginning July 1st, 2013 and ending on June 30th, 2018. Emergency certificate attached. You've heard reading by title of item 6A. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6A pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Again, I, I just believe this should, we should have at least two readings of this so we could have a little more time for public input. In. Um, and I did speak to a few employees that did meet with the company and they did seem pleased, which is good to hear, um, that they, they were getting some of the, their packages back, which, which certainly is the right thing to do. Um, but I would just like a little more time not only to review it, but to listen to the public. Mr. Yeah, Rogan. I'll, oh, okay, I'm sorry. And I'll reiterate what Mrs. Evans said, that uh, we have followed procedure in the selection of Republic, and that it's, I believe, it's time to put them to work. And I, I, I agree with Mr. Rogan's logic, but uh, definitely. I mean, no one's been more uh, pushing for the parking than, than us and, and seeing that it was done right. But the, the issue is we didn't get this down from the city. It was checked out by our solicitor and all that. And here we are at the end of June, and they want to start at July 1st. But I, I do understand where you're coming from. But at this point, I, I have the faith in our, our clerk and our, our attorney that they reviewed everything. And made Thank all you, the Mr. appropriate yes. revisions. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it and so move. 6B, formerly 5M, reading by title, file of council number 32, 2013, an ordinance authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse funds in an amount not to exceed $20,000 from the account into which repayment of urban development action grants UDAG are deposited, UDAG repayment account, in order to finance the cost of an audit of the Scranton Parking Authority to be performed by McGrail, Merkel, Quinn and Associates, PC, for the purposes of completing the 2012 City of Scranton Audit Emergency Certificate attached. You've heard reading by title of item 6B. What is your pleasure? I move that item 6B pass reading by title. Second. On the question? Um, I'd just like to comment that um, I, I think this is important to do because uh, in the number of meetings that we've had, this is holding up Mm -hmm. The lack of a parking authority budget is, or audit, audit is holding up the overall, overall audit, audit and we need to do this so that we can move forward with a lot of items and, and in particular the, the borrowing for the um, um, back pay for Right. Um, and up until now safety. I would say there has been a degree of improved progress this year with regard to the city's independent audit. Mm -hmm. And this is, as you said, 
the major obstacle at this point in time. And since uh, no other party agreed to pay for or participate in the payment of the audit, it's necessary that the city uh, provide that funding as soon as possible to get it rolling. Uh, um, anyone else on the question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it and so moved. Is there anyone who wishes to address council on items 6A or 6B that have been moved to seventh order? Mrs. Craig? Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Public Safety for adoption, file of council number 30, 2013, amending file of council number 54, 1986, entitled, an ordinance providing for handicapped parking areas where official signs indicate, defining and prescribing penalties, providing for enforcement thereof, by adding a section providing for a program for the Scranton Police Department to monitor a renewal process on its application for handicapped parking signs. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Public Safety? As chairperson for the Committee on Public Safety, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On uh, the question? It's just on a question uh, to address Mr. Rogan's issue earlier. I will, I'll give you a call, uh, Pat. Uh, I'll set up a meeting with, with the chief and maybe we can present that to him. Yeah, for a like I said, I, I agree with I agree with the intent exactly of the ordinance. But this will um, get it going, and we'll be able to. Look yeah, there, there's there's no question. I agree with the intent. I'm just hopeful that we could work out either some amendments or, or some other ways to fund it, and possibly do away with the fee. I, I, I was hoping it would be tabled. Um, well, it wasn't. The program wasn't designed as a revenue generator. Yeah. It was designed by the acting chief police at our request because there were so many issues with handicapped parking sites throughout the city many individuals uh, who have them needlessly or who have unfortunately passed away and the signs remain in front of their homes and meanwhile we have many many residents who are in dire need of these signs who cannot receive them so the point is I think to ensure there is a process this time where there hasn't been in years which is why we have this stockpiling of signs on so many streets throughout the city where almost every home on the street has its own handicap sign and we can address this appropriately and uh, as, a, as a result provide the signs to the individuals who need them most. And uh, if I could just add, Mr. Loscom and Mr. Rogan, if you could keep me uh, up to date oh, on uh, the talks that you have with um, the chief, I would be very interested in, in it as well because I would like to see the elimination of the $10 fee. I, yeah. I think that it's very burdensome on the handicapped and senior citizens that um, utilize those signs. And yeah, I think most of the cost is, is clerical cost and all the right. mailings and stuff like right. that. That's all it is. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it's, and it's, without the mailings, can, though, you're not keeping track right. annually of those signs. But I it's, do agree. I, I think we all agree that if we can yeah, do it, it for free. It's certainly not a, it's not going to be something that generates revenue, but there, like, like was mentioned, there is a cost associated with it. and. In, in the yeah, in the current form with the fee, you know, I just don't like the sound of taxing, you know, the handicap. But when if we could look into getting a grant, as Mr. Spragley mentioned, or, or finding another way to fund it, I think it's definitely something that we need. So hopefully, it can be altered, and be glad to, to work with anyone who's interested on that. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mr. Yes. Mr. No. Mr. Lassen? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 23, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to grant a special encroachment permit to Mulligan Sports and Spirits to operate an outdoor restaurant <coughs> at 519 Linden Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania. What is the recommendation of the chair for the Committee on Community Development? As chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7B. 
Second. Second. On the question, roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. 7C, formerly 6A, for consideration by the Committee on Public Safety for adoption, file of council number 31, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to enter into a management agreement with Republic Parking System to administer and manage the city's on-street parking meter operation, procure on-street parking meter equipment, enforce violations of city on-street parking meter ordinances, employ personnel to administer and enforce the city's on-street <coughs> metered parking operation, prepare and deliver to the city a budget every year for city approval, deposit gross receipts from monies collected and earned by Republic into a federally insured bank account in exchange for the sum of $5,000 per month for a period of five years beginning July 1, 2013 and ending on June 30, 2018, emergency certificate attached. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Public Safety? As Chairperson for the Committee on Public Safety, I recommend final passage of Item 7C. Second. On the question? Roll call, please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? No. Mr. Loscom? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare Item 7C legally and lawfully adopted. 7D, formerly 6B. For consideration by the Committee on Finance for adoption, file of council number 32, 2013, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to disperse funds in an amount not to exceed $20,000 from the account into which repayment of Urban Development Action Grants, UDAG, are deposited, UDAG repayment account, in order to finance the cost of an audit of the Scranton Parking Authority to be performed by McGrail, Merkel, Quinn and Associates, PC, for the purposes of completing the 2012 City of Scranton audit, emergency certificate attached. What is the recommendation of the Chair for the Committee on Finance? As Chairperson for the Committee on Finance, I recommend final passage of item 7D. Second. On the question, roll call please. Mr. McGough? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Lasko? Yes. Mr. Joyce? Yes. Mrs. Evans? Yes. I hereby declare item 7D legally and lawfully adopted. Mrs. Evans, before we adjourn, um, will we be placing the FMP Realty um, issue on the agenda for the July 11th? Yes. Okay. I didn't want to place it on the agenda until the public caucus had been conducted. Great. And uh, just for the information of the viewing public, uh, City Council will not meet next Thursday July 4th, we will resume our regularly scheduled meetings on Thursday, July 11th. If there is no further business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>